Welcome to the Jobs and Skills Summit. A very special welcome to everyone watching in offices and homes across Australia, and of course, to those of you in the room, and a special welcome also to our distinguished guests. My name is Helen McCabe. I'm the founder and managing director of Future Women and your MC for the next two days. I would also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land, the Ngunnawal people on whose land we are gathered. For context, I'm, the founder of the, I'm also the founder of the Future Women Jobs Academy. It is a fully virtual program successfully connecting women who've had career breaks to jobs and study. So, in short, I bring to this event my experience as a business owner, my work in developing the Jobs Academy, and a deep understanding of the women who make up the 10% gap in the workforce participation rate. Now, when I was invited to take on this role, my immediate reaction was awkwardly, absolutely no way. I had a couple of concerns, obviously, one of which was how on earth could I be expected to keep this show running to time? I think we're already running behind. Um, but Treasury's Employment Task Force has solved that for me. Taking our inspiration from the Oscars, we've appointed a single person somewhere in the building somewhere to turn the job of turning your microphone off should you run over time. Having said that, my aim is to try to prevent that from occurring. And despite my initial response to the invitation to be here today, might I say, as those of you know in the room, it is a genuine privilege to be a part of this historic occasion. The success of the next two days is in our hands. And so without further delay, it is now my great pleasure to invite Paul Girawa House to welcome us to country. Mandangu, Wurgawari, thank you, and Naramarang, Jumburubura Marambang, Yelangalangbu, Gibabango, Wugabu, Migabu, Guranil Bangmain. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, young men, young women, distinguished guests. The Honourable Anthony Albanese, MP, Prime Minister of Australia. The Honourable Dr Jim Chalmers, MP, Treasurer of Australia. Auntie Pat Turner, CEO Nacho, Leader Convener, Coalition of Peaks. Yuundu, Paul Girawa House, Nadu Maradu Marei Biringo, Guji Gango, Nyambri Nurumbango. My name is Paul Girawa House. I was born here on Nyambri country at the old Canberra Hospital. Nyari in Jamali. Bala Nama, Dr. Matilda Williams House. My respects to my mother, Dr. Matilda Williams House, Nyambri Elder. We honour our matriarchs, our patriarchs. Because of them, we can. Nyari Njamali, Nyambri Gumal, Wogalu, Wallabalau, Nunawa, Muradri, Mujigang, Yanangbu, Jandu. My respects to Nyambri Gumal, Wogalu, Wallabalau, Nunawa, Muradri, Elders, past and present. Nyari Njamarabu, Mujigango, Nurumbonji, Gugu, Nini, Yiradu, Mayin. My respects to all elders and people from all parts of the country. Yinjimara Bala, Gujigang, Gagumara, Wala, Nungay, Yalara, Tulani. Respect is in the government, embracing voice, treaty, truth telling. Nadu Udagabigi, Balabambu, Gubu, Balagi, Bangubu, Guinguli, Ala, Dumbari, now Muruwe, Marambu. We listen to our old people, our ancestors, they show us the straight, the correct, the right path. They protect us, they guide us, they nurture us, they take care of us. Looking to see, listening to hear, and learning to understand. Respect. Be patient, be polite, be gentle. Take responsibility. Respect is taking responsibility for the now, the past, and the present. As First Nation people, we believe we're entitled to a greater share in the wealth and prosperity of this country. We want to see our children grow up in a society that acknowledges, respects, and honours First Nation people in this country. The law of the land talks about giving respect and honour to all people in all parts of the country. And with this welcome, we ask that you will respect the law of the land. Yinja Mara Mayangalangbu, Yandu Mayangalangdo, Yinja Malgiri, Nyinyogir. 
give honour, be respectful, be polite, be patient, then people will respect you. Yinjamadabala, Mayangu, Maldan, Nurubangu, Miyagan. Respect is in the people working on country to provide for their families. Yinjamadabala, Murun Maginya, Yinjamada, Garan Darang, Wabinyagu, Mayangu, Marangu, Miyagan. Respect is in the policies and the agreements supporting the people to earn a good living for their families. A respectful way of life cares for country. Respect is in our, our matriarchs digging the earth for yams. Respect is in the rivers and the breeze quietly moving through country. Respect everything living and growing. Hold fast to each other, empower the people. Be brave, make change. Get up, stand up, show up. Respect shapes us and lifts up the people. Maram Bangbalang, Noya Goya Malang, Burumba Bira Ninala, Gawaimbana Nurumango, Ninyalga. It's wonderful, it's fabulous to be here to share this welcome the country with you all here today. Wurugawuri, Mandangu, Gaimbana, welcome and thank you. Thank you so much. And now a call to the lectern, uh, the Prime Minister of Australia, the Honourable Anthony Albanese. Well, first of all, I begin by thanking Paul for that wonderful and generous welcome to country. I join with him in acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. I pay my respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. We're here over the next two days, of course, striving for agreement for the good of our country. And I hope we can begin by agreeing that there is so much for our country to gain from answering the generous, patient call of the Uluru Statement from the heart. Sometime. <laughs> Together, we'll all be lifted up as a nation 30 years ago, that wouldn't have happened. Now it happens as a matter of course. And we will, with a, a voice to parliament enshrined in our constitution, all wonder why it hadn't happened 30 years ago as well. To premiers and chief ministers, welcome. To my colleagues, uh, parliamentary colleagues from across the spectrum who are here, welcome as well. Uh, to all of our friends who are here uh, from the whole of Australian society, welcome. And to my fellow Australians, uh, welcome to Parliament House. Thank you for bringing your energy, your ideas and your leadership to the National Jobs and Skills Summit. The two days ahead of us have been shaped by more than 100 different roundtables and consultations 
undertaken by ministers and government members across every portfolio right across our vast continent, involving many tens of thousands of Australians if you add up all the meetings. And I also want to acknowledge all the conversations that businesses and industry and unions and community groups have engaged in and led themselves, working to bring shared principles and concrete proposals to this gathering. I thank you for the spirit, but also the substance of your contribution. And in the same vein, I'm very pleased to announce that yesterday at National Cabinet, we reached an agreement between the Commonwealth and every state and territory government to create an additional 180,000 fee-free take places for 2023. This is a $1.1 billion package, and we've agreed to share the costs between the Commonwealth and the states and territories. We'll continue to cooperate on the design of the long-term national skills agreement, and indeed we've agreed to the principles that will shape it. But in recognition of the urgent challenges facing our nation, we are taking action now with a billion dollar training blitz driven by public TAFE. We want to see more Australians gaining the skills they need to find good jobs in areas of national priority. And I want this to be the beginning, not the end, of the progress that we see on skills and training over the next two days. Because it's my great hope that this Jobs and Skills Summit marks the beginning of a new culture of cooperation, a new focus on working together to deal with the urgent challenges that our economy is facing, and new efforts to build together for the long term so Australians can seize and own the opportunities of the next decade. The summit's agenda reflects the challenges that the industries and businesses and people you represent are dealing with each and every day. Staff and skills shortages, missing links in supply chains, growing demand on our caring and community sector, an energy grid which is simply past its use-by date, structural barriers that deny women equality in opportunity, in pay and in financial security, and the squeeze of stagnant wages and rising living costs. These challenges are significant, but more than that, they're urgent. In a few moments, the Treasurer will speak to the combined pressure that these forces are placing on the budget and the economy. And once Jim has done that, I respectfully ask that all of us take the context as read and assume that our respective starting positions, our opening bids, if you like, are known and understood, because we've got a bit under two days. Let's promise each other that we won't spend them playing our greatest hits, rehashing the same arguments or reheating old conflicts. We have not gathered here to dig deeper trenches on the same old battlefields. Our goal, and indeed our responsibility, all of us, is to carry the conversation to the common ground where the work is done and the progress is made building a stronger, fairer economy on the broadest possible foundation. Of course, I don't expect us to solve every problem and fix every issue before tomorrow afternoon, nor do I imagine everyone will be happy with every outcome. Compromises will need to be negotiated. Sacrifices will need to be made. But if we can get it right, if we can seek out the points of consensus rather than reasons for disagreement, the results will certainly be worth it. I've said before, Australians have conflict fatigue. It's one of the reasons why I'm standing here as Prime Minister in a new government. They want politics to operate differently, and we intend to lead in that regard. And I must say, that the way that the National Cabinet is functioning with agreement across the political spectrum is an example of what we are searching for and what is being achieved already. But we need increased productivity. We need stronger wages. We need a workforce that's ready with the skills and smarts and support to succeed in the years ahead. 
This is the opportunity that is in front of us. But more than that, it's our responsibility as leaders. The responsibility we owe to the people who don't have a seat in this room. Nurses on their way home from the night shift. Farmers up before the sun. Small business owners there long before opening, staying well after close. Childcare workers, not only doing a vital job in the face of pressures and shortages, but making it possible for millions of other people to do their jobs too. The workers in this very building who are making this event possible, the cleaners, the caterers and the security staff as well. All those Australians stacking shelves, cleaning offices, building homes, moving freight around the country. These are the heroes of the pandemic. They deserve more than our thanks. They deserve us putting our shoulder to the wheel to make sure that they have the opportunity that is this great country's promise. The Australian economy is not some abstract concept removed from people's lives. It is about them. Australians, Australian workers are our economy. Educators and carers, miners and producers and farmers and tradies, tourism operators and hospitality workers, entrepreneurs and innovators, startups and small business owners. Every Australian holds a stake in the outcome of our discussions. Every Australian deserves our best efforts to seek consensus, to achieve progress. And when we work together to unlock the new growth and broader opportunity and productivity gains our nation needs, every Australian should share in the benefits, including people who have been trapped in long-term unemployment or held back by disadvantage, including older Australians who want to get back into work and have a great deal to give, including people with disability being empowered to fully participate in careers in every part of Australian society, including our veterans, people of extraordinary capacity looking for someone to recognise their potential. Because the work of building a stronger economy should include everyone. It should lift everyone up. Now we've all got work to do. So I'll finish with this point before I hand over to Jim. When Bob Hawke brought the National Economic Summit to the old building down the hill in 1983, he concluded his opening remarks with a quote from John Curtin, summoning the inherent quality of the Australian people to face the crisis ahead. That summit of 1983 is as many years removed from us as the Second World War was from them. Just think about that. Time, trade and technology mean that we confront a very different set of challenges in our globalised world. The world has been transformed. We don't have the same levers to pull. But the inherent quality of the Australian people remains a constant. Through all the hardship and heartache and uncertainty and disaster of the past few years, Australians have been simply magnificent. Australians have shown time and time again they can rise to any challenge. Businesses did it. Unions did it. Australians did it, got us through the pandemic. So let all of us, as leaders and representatives, rise to this moment. Let's work together. Let's listen to each other. Let's make every effort to turn agreement into action for the benefit of all Australians. Thank you very much. And I introduce the Treasurer of Australia and I thank him for the extraordinary effort in leading the work leading up to this summit today. Jim Chalmers. Thanks very much, Prime Minister. Thanks very much, Helen McCabe, for agreeing to uh, run the show the next couple of days. Thank you to Amanda and Rhonda for making sure that our discussions are more accessible to more people. Uh, thank you, Paul, for your characteristically kind and generous welcome to these Ngunnawal and Ngambri lands. For tens of thousands of years, a place to meet 
and settle differences. And to everyone here from all parts of Australia and every corner of our economy, thank you not just for your time, but for the spirit with which you've come here, for your candour and your commitment. We've seen it in more than 100 workshops and forums which have informed our work here already. We meet today at a critical juncture. This is a defining moment for our economy and for our country. We are conscious of the historical parallels, but we are focused forwards to the future, upwards to the possibilities and outwards to the people we represent. Together we can draw a line under a wasted decade of unnecessary conflict and needless division which has held us back. This summit, this Prime Minister and his government, and I think at its core our country, is all about one thing bringing people together to confront the big challenges in our society and in our economy. Now these, as the Prime Minister said, are already largely agreed, already largely understood. Stagnant wages, high and rising inflation, flatlining living standards, skills and labour shortages, migration settings and bargaining rules which don't seem to work for anyone as well as they could an economy not productive enough or competitive enough, not growing strongly enough or broadly enough, too many locked out and held back from the benefits of a national unemployment rate with a three in front of it. And I think that we all recognise that while our economy is growing, these challenges that I've run through, these pressures are growing as well. Some of them are imposed on us by the world, but some of them are homegrown. Some of them are new, but many of them are long-standing. So we know what we're up against. We understand our shared responsibilities here at this summit. And I think each of us is alive to the opportunities that consensus and common ground and common purpose can create for our people. And our goals are just as clear. A stronger, broader, more sustainable economy that creates more opportunities for more people in more corners of our country, where productivity flows from investing in our people and in their ability to adapt and adopt new technology in new industries, but also in areas of traditional industrial strength as well. Where full, full employment is not just a statistical or a historical oddity, but it actually means something to real people in real communities. An economy where every Australian who wants a good, secure, well-paid job can find one. And where every employer who needs a good, enthusiastic, well-trained worker can find one as well. Rising profits and rising wages, not rising profits or rising wages. An economy that re-establishes the link between national economic success and the ability to provide for loved ones and get ahead. Those are our objectives and that is our vision. And I want to thank the lead ministers uh, running sessions with Helen's help over the next couple of days. Uh, Brendan O'Connor on skills, Claire O'Neill on migration, Amanda Rishworth on participation, Katie Gallagher on equal opportunities for women, Tony Burke on bargaining and job security, Ed Husick on the future potential of our industries, and Jenny McAllister on energy. We'll hear from Ross Garno and Yasmin Poole at dinner. But first up today is Danielle Wood on productivity and full employment. And I want to thank Danielle for agreeing to get us started. Investing in the productivity of our people and businesses and maintaining full employment should be the first things that we agree here today because our future prosperity in such a large part depends on them. Last year's intergenerational report showed real GDP growing at 2.6 per cent over the next 40 years compared to the historical average of 3 per cent. The last decade has been the worst for productivity in 50 years, effectively a lost decade. As a share of the economy, business investment has been trending down since 2012. It's now at its lowest level since 1992, around the time that Australia was in recession. 
Australia does have a productivity problem, and that's become a growth problem, and that can become a wages problem. Real wages are lower today than they were a decade ago. The lower rate of productivity growth in recent years and the low rate of wages growth is not a coincidence. There is a connection. And if Australia's productivity growth averages 1.2 per cent in the future instead of going back to the 1.5 per cent assumed in that intergenerational report, gross national income will be $13,000 per person lower in real terms by 2060. So we must make productivity growth an urgent task, a national task, a task for all of us. And not just because higher profits depend on it, but also because higher wages depend on it too. An economy capable of sustaining full employment depends on it as well. But as we've learned, I think, a low unemployment number doesn't by itself solve everything. We can't take this historically low rate for granted, not at a time of global uncertainty and volatility. But with unemployment at a near 50-year low, we should consider this once-in-a-50-year opportunity to make sure a full employment economy can deliver what we need it to for our people. It's not just about what non-inflationary level we could get it down to. It's not just a number or some kind of theoretical concept. It should mean jobs which allowed people to build security and dignity in their lives, where the barriers to employment are systematically dismantled, and where Australians are getting the most that they can from work through their wages and their living standards and their life chances, by training them for higher wage opportunities, by reforming childcare so parents can work more and earn more if they want to, and growing our economy and our industries the right way. So at this summit, we are looking for broad areas of consensus. We are looking for the common good. And we are asking you for your ideas on what you can do, not just what others here in the room can do. We're not looking for unanimity on the perfect position of a comma in a communique. Instead, at the conclusion of the summit tomorrow, we want to release an outcomes document that covers the priorities we think are ready for immediate action this year and then some others that will be subject to further work, whether that be as part of the white paper process or subsequent budgets or through cooperation with our friends from the states and territories. So this summit is just one step. It's a major step, an important step, but still just one step. Our expectations are tempered and they are realistic. We are not naive about how contentious some of the issues we will discuss here have been and will be. But we have been so heartened and energised and encouraged by the willingness that you have already shown to give a little. We've already made substantial progress. We've got a big chance here. This is a time of great challenge and great opportunity and that's why we're here. That's what this Jobs and Skills Summit is all about. That's what our Prime Minister is all about. It's what his government is all about. Bringing people together, finding common ground, turning challenge into opportunity. So over the next two days, during times of tension, and yes, there will be tense moments, let's remember why we are here and who we are here for. Each of us walked in this morning with different backgrounds, different opinions and some different objectives, but with a common purpose to help build that bigger, better trained, more productive workforce with rising incomes and living standards and more opportunities for more people in more parts of Australia. And that's what needs to guide us over the course of these next two days. Now, we wouldn't have invited you here if we didn't think you had an important contribution to make. And you wouldn't have come here if you didn't agree. So thank you and let's get to work. Treasurer, thank you, and Prime Minister, thank you, and again, thank you to Paul for that excellent um, welcome to country. Our keynote speaker for today is a passionate advocate for women in economics and was the co-founder and first chair of the Women in Economics Network. Her name is Danielle Wood. She's the CEO of the Grattan Institute and leads Grattan's budgets and government program. 
Her work aims to improve the lives of Australians through policy, research and advocacy. Welcome, Danielle Wood. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Helen. I am so delighted to be invited to, to give this address to set the scene for what I hope will be uh, two days of robust conversation, yes, but also forward policy momentum. Uh, as the Prime Minister and Treasurer have already said, we're opening with a focus on full employment and productivity. And they may sound like abstract economic concepts, but ultimately they are ones that have a real impact on the quality of life for each and every Australian. So I'm going to start with full employment. Right now we are in the extraordinary position of having unemployment with a three in front. And that has come alongside a record number of Australians working. This matters. It means that more people who want a job now have one. It means that people that might otherwise be at the fringes of the labour markets, young people looking for their first job, people with a disability, older workers and the long-term unemployed are seeing doors open in ways they haven't in the past. Full employment also represents pain avoided. Before COVID, the average spell of unemployment was almost a year long. But even just three months out of a job is enough to, people, to hit people's earnings potential several years later. The cumulative effect of a three-month spell of unemployment is equivalent to nearly a year of lost pay. Tight labour markets mean that people can find new work more quickly and hopefully avoid these economic scarring effects. Not to mention the mental and emotional issues that often run hand in hand with unemployment. But the benefits of full employment extend far beyond those who would otherwise be out of work. Tighter labour market conditions catalyse better labour market outcomes for all workers. As we know, real wages have been in a holding pattern for the best part of a decade. With current inflation, they are going backwards. Grattan Institute analysis suggests that one third of the slowdown in wages growth since 2013 occurred because of tepid macroeconomic conditions. Now, while we may have slightly overshot in adjusting the taps and, and things are now perhaps running a little too hot, these pressures will likely dissipate, particularly if our central bank and our federal government work together to take the heat out of demand and do what is possible to boost supply across the economy. But my central point remains, a strong labour market will over time translate to higher pay for all workers. There are, of course, other things that affect the rate of wages growth, and we're going to be discussing those over the next couple of days. But a strong economy with low unemployment is necessary and vital to getting wages moving again. It also matters for inequality. Our work shows that low wage, low wealth workers have the most to gain from full employment. Their unemployment rates fall by more than other groups when the overall unemployment rate is lower. When unemployment is lower, it lowers the cost of leaving a bad job and finding a better one. It's good for workers, but it's also good for productivity. Poor performing businesses that survive not on the strengths of their products and services, but off the back of exploiting their workforce are driven out. Investments and workers flow to better run businesses. But when the dust settles on the current unusual period of hot demand and disrupted supply, what are we going to be recovering to? Can we lock in the benefits of full employment or will we return to the so-called secular stagnation of the previous decade? Around the world, that decade sandwiched between the GFC and COVID was one best characterised by economic funk. Wages were stagnant, unemployment was elevated, aggregate demand was weak. The animal spirits of business appeared to be largely in hibernation. Although profits are relatively high and interest rates were low, investment was weak, rates of new firm entry and entrepreneurship declined, and so did rates of firm exit. Whether we can permanently shake that funk depends on the actions of the groups represented in this room. Can we agree today to make full employment our economic lodestar? A commitment to strive to maintain full employment is probably the single biggest commitment we could make to deliver better economic outcomes for Australians. Maintaining a full employment economy will require prioritisation of pro-growth investment. It will need an emphasis on taking on and, and training Australian workers, not just able-bodied, job-ready 30-year-olds, but the younger people reaching for their first job, 
people with disabilities and older workers who still want to make a contribution. It will require a substantial upgrade of the policy scaffolding from government, especially the enablers, education policy, climate policy, digital policy, support for care work, to provide a positive ecosystem for investment. Also live is the question of the role of Australia's central bank and federal government in bolstering demand to maintain full employment. In a world of structurally lower interest rates, what role does fiscal policy have in helping the economy run hot enough to maintain a full employment position? These are issues that are front and centre in the current review of the RBA uh, and indeed are being thought about right around the world. Uh, so while these kind of macro levers are not in play for this summit, they do form an important backdrop to the conversation. What is in play though is the role of productivity. Indeed, it's the second headline act for this morning session. While full employment is about making sure we're not leaving Australia's precious human capital on the shelf, productivity growth is about making the best use of every Australian who is employed. Working smarter, not harder may be trite, but it has been the defining feature of almost 80 years of extraordinary growth in living standards. It might be easy to dismiss productivity as the niche fetish of econocrats and AFR journalists, but as the recent Productivity Commission report, Key to Prosperity, makes it clear, productivity matters. At the start of the 20th century, life was materially worse than it was today for the average Australian on many dimensions. Most obviously, we had less stuff with output of goods and services per person at Federation less than one seventh of what it is today. But even more significantly, for every 10,000 newborn babies, more than 1,000 died before they reached their first birthday. Today, that is just three in 10,000. For those who survived childbirth, life expectancy was about 60 years, compared to more than 80 years today. During their 60 years of life, the average Australian worker worked longer hours in more dangerous workplaces and with little access to paid leave. Homes were smaller and more crowded, to say nothing of the absence of indoor toilets, washing machines and dishwashers. I could go on and on. Productivity growth and wages growth over time go hand in hand. But while productivity growth remains the secret source to higher incomes, it is worth acknowledging recent research that finds some reduction in the share of productivity growth that has been passed through to workers over the past 15 years. The other thing we know about productivity growth is we've got less of it than we used to. As the Treasurer said, no matter how you cut it, the rate of productivity growth has slowed over the past decade. If we go over a 60-year period, labour productivity improved on average at a rate of 1.7% a year. Over the decade to 2020, that was 1.1% a year. It's not just an Australian phenomenon. The slowdown has been seen around the developed world, although our relative performance has also slid down the international rankings. Everyone is running slower, but Australia is also falling back in the pack. So why is productivity slowed? Uh, there's no single reason, but there is broad agreement on the main explanations. An expansion of the services sectors, which are generally lower productivity, a declining contribution from technological advancements, and I'm going to come back to that point, smaller gains from education as richer countries reach saturation point on, post, on school completions as well as post-school enrolments, and a reduction in economic dynamism and related to that greater market concentration and power. But while these whys have been well thrashed over and the problem admired from almost every angle, this summit is about the what's. What levers do we have and what commitments can we make, whether as business, as unions, as civil society, as governments, to drive improvements in living standards in Australia for the next decade and beyond? But before I get to that, I think we need to understand the lay of the economic land. Too often conversations about economic policy are conducted in the rearview mirror. They seek to preserve in aspic previous geographic, social and economic structures. This can be an expensive exercise in futility. We cannot push economic water uphill, but we can make sure we move with the flow and strive to provide good opportunities and jobs for Australians regardless of their location, their sector or their personal characteristics. And while I don't have a crystal ball, I want to touch on three themes of change that I think will be important determinants of the shape of our economy and jobs in decades to come. Theme one, the march of the services sector. Over the past 100 years, the Australian economy has undergone a major sectoral transformation. 
essentially from an economy that mainly made goods, stuff you can drop on your foot, to an economy that mainly makes services. At the time of Federation, one in four Australians was employed in agriculture. By 2020, it was one in 36. Manufacturing began its long decline as an employer in the 1970s. But in both sectors, output continued to rise as technological developments meant we could produce more but with fewer workers. The flip side is the extraordinary growth in Australian services sectors. Services now account for about 70% of national output and eight out of 10 Australian workers are employed in services jobs. Services jobs are real jobs. They include our vital health and care workers, our teachers and university lecturers educating young Australians, our scientists and tech workers unleashing the next waves of innovation. The cleaners, drivers, accountants, administrators who provide the economic plumbing that keeps everything running smoothly. Despite being an overwhelming majority, these jobs are too often overlooked in public discourse and policy making. Government responses to economic crises, even services led downturns like the COVID recession, still overwhelmingly emphasise support for the construction and manufacturing sectors. Similarly, government bailouts, subsidies, tax breaks for private businesses also weigh heavily towards these sectors. The rise of services jobs is not something to fight against or bemoan as a country. It is the standard evolution as countries get richer. And indeed, it is expected to continue. Jobs growth estimates from the National Skills Commission suggest health and care, professional services and education will be the biggest growth areas in the next five years. And I think it is a very fair reading of history and demographics to expect that those trends will continue. Theme two, an industrial revolution with a deadline. Australia's economy faces transformative change to meet global and domestic emissions targets. Any credible path to net zero means bringing down emissions in the energy sector and starting to bend the curve on emissions in industry, transport and agriculture over this decade. We are not yet on that path. Indeed, the latest forecasts suggest we are yet to shift the dial beyond electricity emissions. The scale and pace of change have led my Grattan Institute colleagues to dub it an industrial revolution with a deadline. But if the challenge is large, so is the opportunity. Perhaps the clearest way to think about it is a revolution on three fronts. First and most difficult is supporting the people affected by the decline in activities such as coal mining that are incompatible with a net zero economy. The challenge is marrying the phase in, in a way that provides genuine opportunities for the workers in regions such as Hunter Valley, Mackay and Collie. Second, there are existing activities such as steel making and aluminium production, which should be able to transform through low emissions technologies and practices. The transformation of the electricity grid to support the significant growth in renewables generation is a crucial part of that shift. Third, there are the straight up opportunities. New activities such as low emission extraction and processing of critical materials, minerals are small today, but the potential demand is huge and Australia has significant comparative advantages, not to mention large shares of global reserves of important minerals such as lithium, nickel and cobalt. Crucially, if we are able to deliver on the opportunities of those last two fronts, they offer well-paid regional jobs in industries with a sustainable future. So once again, Australia is the lucky country. We are extraordinarily blessed with abundant supplies of renewable energies and critical minerals. I hope today we can commit to being the first-rate leaders who will make the most of this luck to build future prosperity. Theme three, the future is digital. The third and final structural trend I want to touch on is the rise of the digital economy. To date, digital transformation has perhaps loomed a little larger in our everyday lives than in our economic performance. Macroeconomist Robert Solow quipped, we can see the computer age everywhere except in the productivity statistics. But there have always been lags between innovation and the economic dividends it can unleash. This is the so-called S-curve effect. Business simply takes a while to harness the productive capacity of new technologies. Technologies like AI, data analytics, quantum computing, robotics continue to develop in leaps and bounds. And bit by bit, we are learning how to use them to deliver better and cheaper goods and services. This is why I find myself increasingly aligning with the techno-optimists about the transformative potential of these new technologies. One reason this is so significant 
is these technologies have the potential to deliver significant improvements in productivity in services sectors where it has been traditionally harder to shift the dial. From touchscreen ordering in dumpling bars to AI algorithms to prioritise scarce emergency room resources, the use case of these technologies will continue to grow. Australia does well in terms of some of the foundations. We compare positively internationally on rankings of things like cloud connectivity, but we have much lower adoption of tools such as data analytics and artificial intelligence that will be critical in driving process improvements into the future. The most common barriers to technology and data adoption identified by Australian businesses are inadequate internet, lack of skills, limited awareness, and uncertainty about the costs and benefits of these new technologies, particularly changing over legacy systems. Some of these will require government investment, such as broadband services and cyber security, as well as building tech skills, but they also require Australian managers to have the know-how to recognise and respond to the opportunities ahead. So with that context now, let me return to my original question. How do we ensure that Australia is best placed to flourish in coming decades, given these shifts in economic activity and work? I want to touch on three priorities, which I think are crucial to any future-proofing agenda and should be a central part of discussion here over the next two days. Priority one, investing in human capital. A flourishing modern economy requires investment in people. Bill Gates has argued that the best leading indicator of a country's outlook in 20 years' time is the performance of their education system. Unfortunately, that particular leading indicator does not look too crash hot for Australia. Data from the OECD shows that the performance of Australian school students in reading and maths is declining both compared to other countries and compared to our own performance over time. The average Year 9 student is more than one year behind in maths compared to where a student of the same age was at the turn of this century. For reading, it's around nine months. And just as worryingly, the learning gap between students from advantaged and disadvantaged backgrounds more than doubles between Year 3 and Year 9. If we're going to thrive as a nation and build prosperity, we simply have to turn this around. There is a growing evidence base around what works in terms of teaching, but we struggle more with how to flow that through to practice on the ground. At the same time, we need to do more to attract and retain high-performing teachers. But there are other aspects of education that will also need to evolve if we're going to be, remain a leading economy in coming decades. Boosting the vocational education and training system that has been left as a poor cousin to our universities, and it sounds like yesterday's announcement will be a very positive step in that direction. Alongside that, improving links between industry, vet and higher education to build feedback loops on the skills that are needed as jobs evolve. Acknowledging that education is a lifelong endeavour, for example, through recognition of micro-credentials and better support for on-the-job training. And attracting the best and brightest to Australia by improving the composition and functioning of our skilled migration program. Priority two, making better use of our talent pool. Also critical to Australia's success is going to be harnessing our existing pool of talent to its fullest potential. One US study estimates that up to 40% of the growth in living standards between 1960 and 20, 2010 was due to better allocation of talent. As barriers to women and minorities participating in the workforce were reduced, participation deepened the talent pool and made better use of that country's human capital. This process still has a significant distance to run in Australia. Australia has some of the highest levels of education for women in the world, but we currently rank 38th in the world when it comes to women's economic opportunities. Women are often excluded from full-time work and from the most prestigious and high-paid roles because these so-called greedy jobs are incompatible with the load of unpaid care still disproportionately shouldered by women. I can't help reflect that if untapped women's workforce participation was a massive iron ore deposit, we would have governments falling over themselves to give subsidies to get it over the, out of the ground. Existing policy norms and existing policy, sorry, combined with gendered norms, box in women's and men's choices. Australia has some of the most gender segregated occupations, as well as the most gendered divisions of labour in the OECD. Indeed, we lag only a few countries, such as Japan and South Korea, in the relatively large premium of unpaid work done by women compared to men, and the mirror gap in paid work hours. High quality, low cost, early education and care 
is, uh, is necessary to unlock participation from women who would like to work more but are sidelined by substantial cost hurdles. Our work shows this is one of the biggest economic levers that governments have. Given this, I'm delighted by the federal government's emphasis on making early learning and care more affordable and taking steps towards universal low-cost care. Similarly, state government moves to make kindergarten free for three and four-year-olds and, and tackle childcare deserts are important for early education as well as women's workforce participation. But generational change will only come if men are also encouraged to participate more in unpaid care. Cultural shifts like this tend to play out over decades rather than years, but policy can shape culture. Australia invests less in parental leave than most other OECD nations. Yet we know there is growing evidence from other countries with more generous and gender equal leave that these can be an important catalyst for change. In Australia, it is business that's currently leading the charge. But for society shaping change, the government paid parental leave scheme will also need to evolve. Other changes will also be needed to make sure we make the best of our talented people in decades to come. Tackling barriers for other groups. I have focused my remarks here today on women with children. That's where I do research. But it is equally important that we tackle the economic and structural barriers to other groups participating to their fullest, including Australians with disabilities, our First Nations people and older Australians. Making sure care jobs are good jobs. Properly remunerating our care work is going to be critical to providing the quality and quantity of health, disability and aged care services that our older population will demand. The same is true of our early childhood workers, who are both critical enablers of workforce participation and the first and crucial step in the formal learning journey of our children. These sectors are faced with dire shortages of workers. In aged care, CEDA estimates an additional 35,000 direct care workers will be needed annually. For early learning and care, Asequia estimates we will need an extra 39,000 early childhood workers by next year. This problem has been a long time in the making. High workloads and low pay are pushing people out of these sectors and making it unattractive for others to enter. 58% of early childhood workers are paid award wages, which can be as low as $22 an hour. You can certainly under understand why an early childhood educator might decide to take the step away from their important but complex and emotionally taxing work to take up a higher position, pay higher paid position working at Bunnings or the drive through at McDonald's. These are not just normal IR questions. Low wages in these sectors are a result of entrenched gender biases and expectations that women will care selflessly and for little money. And for a long time they have. But now, fairness and market reality dictate that pay will need to rise. It is critical that governments commit to making these investments because these sectors are the enablers. Care workers, as well as delivering crucially important service, free up others to participate in the paid workforce. As a society, we do not balk at billions being channelled into new roads to shave a few minutes off commute times, yet we have not made the necessary investments to ensure that some workers can make it to work at all. Priority three, restoring economic dynamism. One of the most concerning aspects of the most recent slowdown in productivity growth has been the extent it derives from a slowdown in economic dynamism. The Australian economy, like the rest of us, looks increasingly older, fatter and slower. Rates of firm startups, exits and job switching declined in recent years before COVID, impeding the normal flow of resources from low productivity to higher productivity firms. Indeed, not only are we not experiencing a great resignation in Australia, it is something like the opposite. The proportion of workers who change jobs each year has been declining steadily for decades. In addition, the performance gap between firms on the global frontier of technology and Australian firms has widened. Low levels of dynamism and innovation have been linked to a lack of competitive pressure in the economy. In competitive markets, excess profits should be dissipated over time as new and innovative competitors enter. But increasingly in Australia and elsewhere, we have seen the biggest and most profitable firms remain largely untroubled by new competitors. Grattan Institute work shows that among the 20% of Australia's most profitable firms in 2015, almost one third were also amongst the most profitable a decade earlier. Australia's competition minister, Andrew Lee, shows that the turnover in the group of market leaders across Australian industries has also slowed. 
So while being relaxed and comfortable may be profitable in the short term, it is not good for Australia's long-term economic prospects. So how do we restore a more dynamic business sector? Making sure that Australia's competition laws are fit for purpose is part of the response. Healthy competition is not just about lower prices, but the relentless quest to innovate and deliver new and better products and services. The former head of the ACCC, Rod Sims, has argued that the current merger laws are failing to adequately protect competition. His warning should prompt serious thought. Governments should also be wary of their own, the capacity of their own decisions to divert resources from productive investments. Poor policy design has cost consumers and taxpayers in a whole range of sectors, from superannuation to vocational education and training to disability services. Beyond the immediate waste of this cream skimming, there are dynamic costs. Economists have long warned of the productivity sap from rent seeking. We should not want to be a country where firms see more upside in lobbying to get a better deal from policymakers than from investing in better products and services. Our 2018 report, Who's in the Room, suggested this is a real concern from us for Australia. Heavily regulated sectors such as mining, property and construction and gambling are characterised by remarkably high levels of political donations and lobbying compared to their relative economic contribution. That is why institutional reforms to reduce disproportionate access and influence are economic as well as integrity reforms. It's also why market design and commissioning in government funded markets such as care services, education and training and health represent the new frontier in the government's microeconomic reform agenda. Restoring economic dynamism will also require an appetite to tackle other impediments to the, labor of the movement of labour and resources. These include overly restrictive land use planning laws and stamp duty that discourage mobility and sap the productive capacity of our cities. Addressing outdated skilled migration rules should also be high on the list. Overly bureaucratic occupation lists are poor predictors of the future economic contribution of new migrants. Targeting higher wage migrants directly for both temporary and skilled migration would improve the productivity of the migration system and the Australian workforce. But finally, what of our people? How do we encourage workers to be bold and to thrive and thrive in a more dynamic economy of the future? The 2018 International PISA survey found that 42% of Australian teenage boys and 52% of teenage girls expected to work in just one of 10 common jobs by the age of 30, including as a, do a doctor, a lawyer, or a police officer. This set of aspirations has actually narrowed since the turn of the century. The lack of awareness of the breadth of jobs, particularly in fast growing sectors, diverts young people from career paths that would generate greater benefits both for them and the country. We need much more communication with parents and young people about the jobs and skill sets of the future. We also need to tackle structural impediments to dynamism and risk taking. The two decade long run up of house prices relative to incomes means that any young person hoping to get on the property ladder can expect to take on vastly more debt than a young home buyer 20 years ago. High household indebtedness constrains the capacity of young people to take on the risk of starting a business or even a career change. Similarly, if we want to genuinely improve worker mobility, we have to consider the role of the social safety net. Upgrading skills or even changing jobs can be costly and risky, particularly for more vulnerable workers. The weakening of the safety net as unemployment benefits have declined relative to wages means that workers are less insured for taking those risks. If we want Australians to take a leap in the name of better opportunities, they need to know society will be there to catch them if they fall. In conclusion, let me say this summit comes at an extraordinary time. Unemployment is lower than I've experienced in my lifetime and we are in the early phase of significant structural shifts in jobs and activities as our economy decarbonises and digitises. This is a summit for grappling with how we manage those transitions and embrace the challenge of creating a more productive and dynamic future. So my final provocation to delegates are these. Can we commit to full employment as a policy objective and capitalise on the extraordinary opportunity to give our long-term unemployed, our older job seekers, people with a disability, a chance to open the door to participation in work? Can we decide to invest in human capital big time, to turn around the slide in our school results, to rebuild our vocational education and training sector and improve the quality of the signals we send to our young people 
about the skills and qualifications that will be needed in the future. Can we embrace the principle that no one who wants a job or more hours should be held back by structural barriers, such as discrimination or inaccessible and expensive care? And can we recognise the importance of boosting innovation, of strong market competition, of better policy design and of government investment in the enablers like cybersecurity to restore our economic dynamism and even become an economy on the technological frontier? Thank you so much, uh, and I really look forward to productive discussions over the next two days. Danielle, thank you very much, and um, may we all see women's workforce participation like an iron ore deposit um, by the end of these next two days. Uh, the session Equal Opportunities and Pay for Women will be next on the agenda and it is led by Sam Mostyn, the President of Chief Executive Women. I invite the panel to head... No, the panel... Yeah, the panel can head up. Yeah, thank you. Um, as, you as you're arriving, um, the opening presentation will be delivered by the Minister for Finance, Women and Public Service, Senator Honourable Katie Gallagher, followed by Dr Leonora Rees from RM RMIT University. The panellists include June Oscar, Emma Falou, Michelle O'Neill and Dr Rees. Please make them all welcome. Thank you very much, Helen, and I also acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to Elders past and present and thank uh, Paul for his generous welcome to country. Danielle, your address raised the urgent need to address women's economic equality. This is something that the government furiously agrees with. The Albanese government aims to restore Australia's leadership in gender equality by building on our ambitious plan for women. And this summit is an example of that objective. Right from the beginning, the Treasurer and his team uh, ensured that gen this summit itself had a gender equality lens. And I'm pleased to say that more than 50% of the participants here today are women. Women have a leading role in every session and we are hopeful uh, that uh, women's uh, gender equality and women's economic equality um, is a feature of all of the sessions of the next uh, two days. Since coming to government, we've already started this by uh, supporting wage increases for women in dominated sectors like aged care. We're strengthening the focus on gender wage gaps and pay transparency, introducing paid domestic violence leave and making childcare cheaper. We're getting the foundations right by adopting gender responsive budgeting and embedding gender analysis across government decision making processes. The Women's Economic Equality Task Force will be announced shortly and will assist me with the work ahead including on the development of the national strategy for gender equality. And I'm so pleased that this task force will be chaired by Sam Mostyn who is also going to facilitate this session's panel. The Prime Minister has given me a portfolio of women, finance and the public service. This puts gender equality at the heart of government. It's a unique opportunity and it's one that we will use to drive change. I firmly believe that the Australian public service should lead the way on setting the standard and ambition on gender equality and I acknowledge the strong leadership from the private sector which provides a roadmap for this ambition, especially on parental leave. We've heard from many women, as well as businesses and unions in the lead up to this summit. I'm heartened by the universal commitment to women's economic equality that I've heard and by the clear focus on solutions. This summit represents a huge opportunity to agree that women's economic equality is a core economic imperative that is crucial to our economic resilience and prosperity. As a country, we simply can't afford to leave women's talent on the shelf. If women's workforce participation matched men, we would increase GDP by 8.7 per cent or $353 billion by 2050. Over the next two days, in every discussion and for every solution, we should be looking at how we unlock the talent and potential of Australian women and remove barriers for all of them. We have a big task ahead of us, but we also have momentum and I believe a shared commitment for change. 
To Sam, I'm really excited to work with you in your new role as Chair of the Women's Economic Equality Task Force. Thank you for agreeing to take on that role and this role to facilitate this session. I thank all of the panellists uh, for their agreement to participate in this session. And would uh, everyone please welcome Sam Mosson to facilitate equal opportunity and pay for women. I think we're on. There we are. Thank you, Minister Gallagher, for those very kind words. And thank you for um, inviting me to chair the task force. I can tell you that the task force members uh, will be listening carefully to the work of the next two days. And you can expect that many of the recommendations that come out on Friday will be the subject of a lot of rigor and consideration as part of the task force work. Uh, it is always inspiring to be on Ngunnawal land, and I wanted to pay my respects, of course, to uh, the traditional owners. I thought Paul Howes made a very special comment on the matriarchs of the elders um, here today and around the country. I'd also like to pay respect to all of the matriarchs in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities who have led the discussions and the opportunities for women's economic empowerment for so long and have been um, largely ignored for so long. And I'm particularly delighted that June Oscar AO is on our panel today to remedy that with her comments about the role of First Nations women in our economic discussions of women's participation. Now, we have a very tight time frame for today's opening session. I would like to thank the Prime Minister and the Treasurer and the Minister for having us up right at the beginning of this event. It sets a tone. It's an important reminder that the conversations that you'll hear today in this session and the remarks that will come from experts on the floor should be the things that are, that are in the back of your minds as we go through all of the panels um, over the next day and a half. I thought Daniel Wood captured in a perfect way the opportunity, um, like Helen, I thought the reference to the opportunity for skills of women being the equivalent of the mineral deposits around our country was spectacular. And the thought that we would ever not invest heavily with a long-term view and an expectation of an extraordinary support for our economy um, would be foolhardy. So a wonderful analogy. And the data in Daniel's um, opening remarks, I think, should drive uh, both our concerns about our wasted opportunity and our optimism for what we can do next. In a moment, I will invite Dr. Leonora Rice to open the panel with a short presentation on the drivers both of the gender pay gap and of women's workforce participation opportunities and the unique issues that we face in Australia. I'll then invite each of the panel members who I'll ask a specific question to make some opening remarks, probably three or four minutes. Um, unfortunately, um, we can't take questions and answers from the floor given the time limits. We may get to have a bit of a conversation before at exactly 9.35, Helen will step in and will seek commentary and expert evidence from a number of you who are in the room today. We'll go to that and then come back to the panel and wrap up and get you to the morning tea break on time. So with that, I'd like to welcome Leonora to set the stage for us on the gender pay gap and women's workforce participation in Australia. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Prime Minister, Treasurer, Minister for Women, all ministers and premiers and chief ministers here today, uh, all attendees, uh, thank you for the opportunity to contribute. I acknowledge we're gathering on the lands of the Ngunnawal people and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and all First Nations people here today. We're talking jobs and skills, so let's kick off with a picture of Australia's job growth over time, illustrating the, the skills we'll need for the future. So there are two things to take away from this graph. The second fastest growing occupation is community and personal service workers. These are our childcare workers, our aged and disability care workers, our educational aides, our welfare support workers, and they're predominantly female. Second, casting a gender lens across the workforce, we still see stark gender imbalances in certain sectors. We can do the same thing for industries. We see healthcare and social assistance and education and training are among our top three fastest growing industries and a three quarter female. 
To sum up our skill needs for the future, the Skills Commission call it the four Cs, care, computing, cognitive ability and communications. But we want to go beyond these standalone skills to recognise the productivity potential that can be unlocked by bringing together a blend of skills and capabilities, a blend of lived experiences and backgrounds when we have a more demographically diverse and balanced workforce. The evidence is clear that more diverse workforces generate more productive outcomes, including by sparking greater innovation, more robust When it comes to care, the true economic value of care services is clear when we think of care as an investment and an economic enabler. Australia has 125,000 women who report that they want to work but can't because of childcare and other unpaid care responsibilities. If they could join the workforce, it would boost women's labour force participation rate by 1.2 percentage points. Think of the economic benefits flowing from that. Once we're in the workforce, we're looking at a gender pay gap of 14.1% on average, and it's even wider in industries such as professional services, health and finance, and there's no industry that doesn't have a gender pay gap. Now, the factors contributing to the gender pay gap are multiple, including industry patterns, women having less opportunity to build experience, and age discrimination faced by older women. But one way to think about the gender pay gap is that it's a number that reflects and encapsulates the inequities that are across our workplaces and across wider society. It especially reflects the influence of gender stereotypes and implicit biases that mean it's not an even playing field. And these biases are compounded for marginalised women, including First Nations women, women living with a disability and migrant women. The gender pay gap should be interpreted as a sign that the strengths and capabilities of women are not being fully recognised, not being fully valued. As an example of gender biases in the, in the workplace, in my own research, I've detected that higher competence is linked to a higher chance of job promotion if you're a man, but not if you're a woman. So there's little use in telling women you just need to be more confident, more ambitious, when workplaces don't value or reward women in the same way they elevate confident men. Other research points towards the double standards that exist for women in leadership compared to men and the motherhood penalty. And these gender biases run in both directions. Men who step into traditionally female roles, such as care roles, also face stigma and discrimination. Achieving equal opportunities means dismantling these gender norms. One in five Australians agree that it is better for a man to be the breadwinner and for women to be the caregiver. Now, shifting these gender norms brings risk and resistance. There's an increased risk of women experiencing uh, domestic abuse if they start to earn more than their male partner. And these gender norms are damaging for men too, in terms of poorer mental health outcomes and a higher involvement in violence. So overall, the evidence shows that gender inequities are a massive handbrake on our economy and on our collective wellbeing. Over to the panel to figure out what to collectively do about it. Thank you very much, Leonora. The, the data is clear and compounding as we go through this morning. I thought I would just add one data point to Leonora's presentation where she ended on the impact of violence. Just yesterday, ANROS, the Australian National Research Organisation on Women's Safety, released the first longitudinal research on the um, prevalence rates of sexual violence against women in this country. And 50% of women in their 20s in this country have experienced some form of sexual violence and slightly less as we get older, um, but no less destructive. The link between that sexual violence and the future um, economic participation, workforce participation of women is now a link that's being much more strongly drawn. So these things are, are all connected and respect for women and dealing with the, uh, the work that Kate Jenkins did on what happens in our workplaces and lack of respect 
it should be seen as a, as a foundational matter as well as the economic data that you've been hearing this morning, something we should all commit to solving. So with that, we'll open up the panel. I'm delighted to go first to Michelle O'Neill, president of the ACTU. Michelle, you've been very active and vocal, not just in the lead up to the summit, but in the last year about the centrality of women to the economy. Would you like to share with us um, your views this morning? Thanks very much, Sam. And I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land we met on today, the Ngunnawal people, and pay all my respects to elders past and present. It always was and it always will be Aboriginal land. In 1983, Prime Minister Bob Hawke held an economic summit. There were 97 participants. One of them was a woman, trailblazer Senator Susan Ryan. Every single one of the business delegates were men. Every single one of the union delegates were men. Not only is this summit unrecognisable from the one held 39 years ago, so is the world of work. In 1983, women's workforce participation sat at 45%. Today, it's 62.8%, and for men, it's 70.8%. That's a big change, but it masks how poorly we sit compared to other OECD countries and how glacially slow is our progress towards equity. Women in Australia are lower paid, have less super, work fewer hours, are more likely to be casual or part-time, have unpredictable hours and rosters, are more likely to work multiple jobs, less likely to have paid leave, more likely to be discriminated against, harassed and assaulted at work. If you're a First Nations woman, living with a disability, from a culturally and linguistically diverse background, or LGBTQIA+, the figures are considerably worse. A few months ago, I met Ruby, and she works in the residential aged care as a carer. Her co-workers told me she was fantastic at a job. And Ruby told me how hard the work was, but how much she loved it. But this was only Ruby's first job because she can't get enough hours or pay to meet the costs of living for her and her kids. She does two other jobs. She also works as a disability care worker and she also works in the hospital as a care assistant. Three jobs, all underpaid, all undervalued, three jobs in the care economy. Our existing industrial relation laws are clearly failing women. We have pay equity laws that perversely require you to run an argument to properly value women's work by identifying a male comparator. We have a minimum wage decision each year that does not consider what's needed for a living wage. We have so-called flexible work arrangements which give you the right to ask for work hours that are consistent with care and family responsibilities, but no rights if your employer says no. We have a bargaining system that's designed for large male-dominated workplaces, locking women in feminised industries out of the system and leaving them without power to join together with others and negotiate. Let's be really clear. Arguments to keep our bargaining system in the past and only enterprise-based are arguments to cement women's low pay for generations to come. Australia has the second worst paid parental leave scheme in the developed world. We have one of the most expensive childcare schemes. We can't let this be the legacy for the next generation. The Australian union movement wants to work with government and business to change this. We don't want to settle on a timeline of 100 years to reach gender and pay equity. To really tackle inequality, we need a new, simple, fair and critically accessible collective bargaining system that add the adds the options of multi-employer or sector bargaining for all. This will open up collective bargaining for women. A fairer approach and stronger rights to family-friendly, flexible work arrangements in our workplace laws that recognise the importance for all of us of balancing work and care. A new approach to setting the minimum wage, which has at its core the need for a living wage. 
increased paid parental leave to 26 weeks with a path to lift us to 52 weeks by 2030 and superannuation paid on parental leave. Early childhood education and care must be made free and accessible to all. And as a first step, the already announced increases in childcare subsidies should be brought forward to the 1st of January next year. Increasing women's pay and capacity to work is good for women. But you know what? It's good for men. It's good for our labour market, it's good for skill shortages, it's good for workplace culture, it makes workplaces safer and fairer. It's good for productivity and it's good for our living standards. It's good for our economy. On every single measure, it stacks up. Halving the participation and pay rate would add $111 billion to our national income. We shouldn't be frightened of change. We should just get on with it. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I'd like to now turn to Emma Fulu, who is the founder and director of the Equality Institute. Emma, these are matters that you've been dealing with and committing your leadership and life to for such a long period. Can you talk us through some of the cultural and social norms that are at play here? And once we've dealt with those, what are the solutions? What are you advocating into the summit? Yeah, thanks, Sam. Hi, everyone. Let me also acknowledge the traditional owners of the unceded lands and all people that we're joining from today and pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging. And I really want to also acknowledge the incredible wisdom that we have to gain and learn from First Nations people in these discussions over the next two days and moving forward as we do this work. We've talked a lot about the gender pay gap and let me unpack that a little bit more in terms of what are the actual drivers of the gender pay gap and how that is cultural and, and social. So we've talked about gender segregation of the workforce, obviously, but where does that gender segregation of the workforce come from? We learn that growing up. We learn that through our, our education system and the cultures that are embedded in. For example, the idea that women are naturally more nurturing or the idea that men are naturally better leaders. So it comes from the toys that we give our children. If you think about if we give trucks to boys and dolls to girls, surprise, surprise, the construction industry is dominated by men and the care economy is dominated by women. And that in and of itself is not necessarily a problem, but it is the fact that we then value male-dominated industries more and female-dominated industries less. We value construction over care, and that is because we value women less in our society. As an individual, you might not think that's the case. I'm sure you don't necessarily value the woman sitting next to you less. But as a society, as a whole, as a culture, we do. You know what the number one driver of the gender pay gap is, though, according to a recent KPMG report? It's discrimination. And by discrimination, we're talking about conscious and unconscious bias in recruitment practices, everyday sexism in the workplace, sexual harassment, and family violence. And we know that the pay gap is worse for people who suffer multiple forms of disadvantage, First Nations women, women with disability, women of colour, older women. And you know what, I think one of the reasons that we're seeing such a significant seal shortage in the service sector post-COVID, apart from the fact that I think we're all just bloody exhausted, um, I'm a single mother of three and running a small business, and I can tell you homeschooling uh, was an incredible challenge, but it's also because of the toxic workplace cultures and women's experiences, even in this very house, of sexism, abuse and harassment. Women are sort of saying, enough is enough. Do I really want to work in a place that doesn't value me as a human being? But despite all of those challenges, women have not stood on the sidelines. We have taken employment into our own hands, started our own businesses and created self-employment opportunities often without the same level of investment or government support of our male counterparts. So when we think of the solutions, we have to be addressing these deep cultural and structural issues. And we need to be supporting the creative, innovative and entrepreneurship of women in this country. So what does that look like? As Danielle Wood said, we really need to invest in human capital. So education is obviously key. But education also needs to challenge those rigid gender norms that we've been talking about. Encourage kids to show up as their full, full selves. Encourage boys into caring. Encourage girls in STEM. 
We obviously need paid and caring, paid parental leave, uh, free early childhood education. But I think it's not just institutional care we need to be thinking about. We can be more innovative that, than that. We need to think about different patterns of care that meet the needs of different communities and families. That could be intergenerational or community-based care as well. And for organisations, many of you in the room today, I ask you to tackle the cultural issues as well. It's not enough to have a sexual harassment policy if the culture that it sits within condones, excuses or minimises that type of everyday sexism and abuse. The evidence shows we get better results when we take a holistic approach in workforce change and cultural change, flexible work practices, leadership and wage gap targets, inclusive recruitment practices, trainings and policies. And finally, we can all play a role in addressing the deeply entrenched discrimination <coughs> and start levelling the playing field. Many of us in this room, myself included, are incredibly privileged. We need to start changing the makeup of who is in the room. Whatever room you're in, whether that's a sports club, a boardroom, a community hall, we need to create space for those who have historically been silenced and excluded single mums, First Nations women, women of colour, women with disabilities. And that is how we'll prosper as a nation. Really, this is a time to be brave. I really ask you over the next two days to fundamentally rethink the way we think about our society, what our society values, and the way we think about work. But I want to leave you with this, that let's remember women in all our incredible diversity, we're not a problem to be solved. We are the greatest untapped resource in this economy, and it's high time that we recognise that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. I'd now like to invite June Oscar AO to make her contribution. June is, of course, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner, and so much more. June, we take the time to acknowledge country to acknowledge First Nations peoples. We do that with a degree of respect and as the Prime Minister has said, it is now a national priority for us to do that into our constitution. I wonder if you have some different reflections though on what that has meant for First Nations women to date and your ambition for First Nations women and the women you work with and represent in the solutions for the, um, the full agency of women in this country. Thank you, Sam. Jalongoro Maringaru, we anagramayane. Nyana, we anagramayane. Nganawaliane, Ngambriyane, Ngana Yangangi Moai. Yadara, Yanange, Ulalawara, Ingarangu, you are Moai. I speak to you in my first language, Bonaba. I acknowledge all of you. I acknowledge the Prime Minister and um, your cabinet, males, females, and I acknowledge all the guests here, Indigenous and non-Indigenous. I acknowledge that we all gather on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country, and I pay my respects um, to their peoples. Prime Minister, thank you for this opportunity um, to hear directly from us on the issues that we consider are important in assisting you and the rest of us in the reforms that are so desperately needed to create a fairer and more equitable society in a country that we can all be very proud of. So thank you. Um, I particularly uh, want to bring to your attention the work that I have been focused on since taking office as the first woman, first Aboriginal woman in the role of Australia's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner in 25 years. So it was important that I mark my coming to office in bringing the voices of First Nations women in our country along with me and into the space of human rights in our country. 
So with the uh, funding support of the National uh, Indigenous Australians Agency, the Australian Human Rights Commission partnered with the government in 2017 and undertook a project focusing on the engagement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and girls. The last time there was a national engagement process was in 1986 under the Department of Aboriginal Affairs, Commonwealth then. So we thought it was time. I thought it was time. So here I have We Yani Udangani. We Yani Udangani is in Bonaba, the voices of women. It's a report uh, tabled in this house on the 9th of December 2020, and it speaks to women's voices securing our rights and securing our future. If you're not familiar with it, please become familiar with it, because herein lies over 2,000 voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and girls on every single issue that impacts our lives on a daily basis. Herein lies the solutions to some of the complexities that others have found difficult and placed in the too hard basket um, to even begin a process of finding solutions. So I urge every single one of you who occupy uh, spaces of influence and authority and um, shared networks to help in elevating the voices of the 2,000 plus Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women that I engaged with in over 50 locations across the country in every single jurisdiction from urban communities, regional towns, remote communities, and very, very remote communities, including women's prisons and juvenile detention centres. So this is a landmark report, very expansive, very detailed. It's 500 pages, but carries with it seven overarching principles for change, with um, guidelines in how to do that with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and girls, because women and girls are calling for their right to agency, their right to be at the table to inform these processes going forward that are so needed that will impact and create opportunities. But no one can do that without us at the table. That is what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women are calling for. And it's, it covers all of the um, key areas um, that women had identified. And this process, we took a very strong human rights-based approach in not engaging with women and girls with a set agenda. We asked them, what was it that's important to you in your right to achieve, your right to succeed, your right to feel supported in this country, and what is it that frustrates you? What is it that causes you disappointment or crushes your spirit in terms of your right to, to be successful? This is what they had to say. We have provided an additional um, document called the Implementation Framework, and this is available on our website and it helps everyone, governments and other stakeholders to um, understand in detail what it is and how it is that we can take those steps forward. So um, Prime Minister, thank you for creating this opportunity. I look forward to working with you and your government and um, the Minister for Women. And I'd like to acknowledge Minister Burney, first Aboriginal woman, a Wiradjuri woman, in the role of um, Minister for Indigenous Australians. So thank you all and wish you well for the summit. Thank you, June. I know in our conversations leading up to 
today, you made the very important point to the panel in our early discussions that um, the change in the landscape for women across this country demands that we not put First Nations women in a deficit category. Um, you don't want special treatment, but you want extraordinary respect for the unique contributions that First Nations women make to our um, economies, our families and our landscapes. And I think you've underscored that. I do commend the report for everyone to pay attention to. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, June. Leonora, just very quickly, any final reflections before we go to the room? Thank you, Sam. Uh, really. <coughs> Uh, so first of all, this is about framing it as a collective issue. So the benefits, if we agree that the benefits of equitable workplaces are widespread and collective, that implies a need for collective responsibility, collective contribution. It involves measuring the value of our care and early learning sectors properly. And if we do that, we have an even stronger rationale for higher wages of our care sector workers. Secondly, policies need to be evidence-based. It comes back to not putting the onus on women to change, but to devise the system. Uh, this includes building accountability into executive level. Among your executives, putting cape, gender equity outcomes as amongst your KPIs. And thirdly, it's about applying a gender lens across all policy, all decision-making. For governments, that entails gender responsive budgeting. That's something that Victoria has advanced on. There's great capacity for all other states and the federal level to match that as well. I'll pause there. Thanks, Leonora. We would love to talk for a lot longer. Um, of course, there's so much more to unpack, but it's time to come to the experts in the room. Um, I'd now like to call on each of them and um, remind you that it's a two minute limit. Helen, I think there is someone who will push the kill button on, the, on your um, speakers, so it would be great for you to keep your, your comments pithy and strong. And I'd like to go first to Helen Daly fisher from Equality Rights Alliance. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the unceded lands of the Ngunnawal and Gambri people, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. Thanks for the invitation to attend and speak here today and for kicking off the summit with a discussion of gender because we agree with the Minister that gender needs to be at the heart of this discussion. The pandemic showed us very clearly that our economic systems are propped up by the unpaid and underpaid labour of women. We can't keep asking women to babysit the economy. It's time that we change how we do our work. We can take steps to improve women's workforce participation rates, but most women are working full time already. We're just not being paid for it. We have to shift the distribution of unpaid work and we have to change our workplaces to make this possible. We should expect everyone to work flexibly at some point in their careers as they meet their fair share of, pay, of caring work. All leadership roles in workplaces must be capable of being worked flexibly. Improved paid parental leave is critical, including a use it or lose it component for men. Government procurement frameworks can be used to provide incentives for employers. It's great to hear the PM commit to funding for TAFE because we really need to put a strong gender lens on our education system. That's where the barriers we see in the workplace start. Let's take work-based place training. If you're uh, training or studying in a female-dominated industry, you will pay your institution for the privilege of completing your course. If you're in a male-dominated industry, you'll be paid to complete your workplace training. The upcoming University Accords must include a, fo a focus on gendered outcomes for students, and we need that new funding for TAFEs to include free and subsidised training in critical areas and direct delivery in regional areas. Australia has one of the most gender-segregated workforces in the world. All education and skills um, strategies in Australia need to include ending this segregation as a priority. And finally, and very quickly, I'd like to note that enterprise bargaining doesn't work well in female-dominated sectors, particularly those which are reliant strongly on migrant populations. We need to start seeing enterprise bargaining as a flexible um, area, and we mustn't see it as an um, all-or-nothing proposition. We need to be thinking carefully about that area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. We'll now turn to Alison Kitchen, the National Chairman of KPMG. We haven't, we, haven't got, we haven't got sound yet. We'll just get the sound here. We still can't hear you. <laughs> no. 
Try now? Yes, That's better. Perfect. Thank you. Third time lucky. Um, thanks, Sam. At KPMG Australia, we echo the other thoughts of people this morning that we're not taking full advantage of women's economic contribution to the workforce. We think social economic expectations have shifted, and we remind the, the room that women of working age today are now better educated than their male counterparts. So government policy and workplace practice needs to change and move beyond a system which values men's work and women's work is not valued. Our current piece of work at KPMG SAM is focused on thinking about how we value unpaid work. And our initial conclusion is that if you value unpaid and paid work, women are doing half of all the work performed in Australia. And yet, as we know, there's a large gender pay gap, a gender income gap, a gender superannuation gap, all meaning that there is entrenched disadvantage for many women. KPMG's 2020 analysis of the childcare subsidy found that across all income scales, mothers with children in childcare could lose up to 75% of their extra income for doing a fourth or fifth day of work. That's much higher than the marginal tax rate paid by the highest income earners, who of course are mostly men. So policies to reform childcare subsidies in the childcare sector are sound investments in tangible economic benefits. They're not welfare. They lift workforce participation and productivity, including women returning to work part-time or full-time, paying more taxes and pumping their increased wages back into the economy. KPMG has calculated that for every dollar invested in those policies, the nation's GDP is boosted by nearly $2. KPMG has also advocated for extending the paid parental leave with incentives for more equal sharing of leave between the father and the mother and we support superannuation guarantee on the paid parental leave. So Sam, I'm thrilled that you've been nominated as the chair of the Women's Economic Task Force. And can I ask that you think deeply about the value of unpaid work so that we can work towards a society where that work is more equally shared and women are no longer punished economically for doing more than their share of the, of the caring in our community. And of course, KPMG will be happy to work with you on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison, and, and thank you for giving us the first agenda item for the work of the Women's Employment Equality Task Force. Thank you. And we will come to KPMG and many others in the room with your resources, but thank you for pointing out that critical role of the unpaid work um, and further um, under, uh, underscoring the data we've been hearing this morning from the perspective of your work. Now I'd like to go to Georgie Dent, who is the Executive Director of The Parenthood. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, not being able to access or afford quality early learning and care remains the single biggest impediment to women's workforce participation and women's economic security in Australia. Most of the 77,000 parents and carers that the parenthood represents know this far too well, not as an abstract concept, but as a barrier that makes their day-to-day -day lives harder. No credible conversation about growing the strength or sustainability of our economy can overlook access and affordability of quality early learning and care. It is key, as we've heard today, to unlocking the full potential of the female workforce. It's key to growing productivity. It's key to investing in human capital. And it will help reverse the educational decline that Danielle referred to. At the moment, one in five children arrive at school developmentally vulnerable. In rural areas, it's two in five. Among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, it's almost half. We know that when those children arrive at school behind, they rarely, if ever, catch up. Children who attend high quality early learning in the years before school are half as likely to arrive at school developmentally vulnerable. So aside from the educational human capital benefits, investing in quality early learning also presents a compelling and immediate solution to the workforce shortages. The government's cheaper childcare package that's due to come in on the 1st of July next year will result in 8% more hours being worked by secondary earners with young children, mostly mums. Mums that, as um, Alison referred to, face an incredibly high effective marginal taxation rate. By lowering the cost of care for these families, we can free up the equivalent of 44,000 additional full-time workers immediately. This potential workforce is right here. They're experienced, they're skilled, they're enthusiastic, and they're willing to work. 
The reason that they're not working at all or as much as they would like to is because families simply either cannot afford or cannot access appropriate care. The Prime Minister recognised this economic insanity um, and has tabled a solution. Um, that solution and the fact that it's a centrepiece of this government's economic reform is profoundly significant. But to realise the productivity benefits and the human capital benefits, we need an early education and care sector that can deliver. To accommodate the extra days and hours that women in particular could work from more affordable care, we will need at least 9,650 additional full-time educators. But like many female-dominated workforces, particularly um, this workforce is, in a, is at a point of genuine crisis. Turnover in this sector has always been far too high because of the pay and conditions. The average turnover has been around 20%, which is considerably higher than the 12% in education more generally. In the past year, vacancies have increased. We're now at a point where vacancies are double pre-pandemic levels. Last month alone, there were more than 6,600 vacancies in early learning services. Without early educators, there is no early education. This workforce contracting is a problem for every other employer and organisation in the country, because if a parent cannot access care, they cannot access work. So it's absolutely critical that while we're here, we address the reasons that early educators are leaving, and we cannot overlook that the lack of pay and the poor conditions are what are driving educators away. And if there is any concern about the cost, we must remind ourselves that the cost of inaction is higher. The average Australian woman misses out on $693,000 in income and $180,000 in super over the course of her life due to our inadequate, inadequate parenting policies, both paid parental leave and early childhood education and care. We currently spend at least $15 billion a year on late intervention for children and young people. If we look at the benefits that we can realise in increased productivity and setting the future generation for, um, up for success, every single dollar we spend is worth it. Thank you very much, Georgie. Thank you for reminding us about the intersections of this panel when it comes to women's economic participation, but the impact on families and children and the care workforce, and for reminding us about the avoided costs that a good investment can, can deal with that's currently in our system. I think it's also worth linking Georgie's comment to Danielle's point on the PISA decline on education attainment of our children. It's a sad fact that one in five children in Australia today start their school with at least one cognitive disadvantage, and we know that the impact of Quali high quality early education can transition that and actually remove those cognitive disadvantages early. And again, it's wonderful for the children and their future. It's a wonderful avoidance of the cost of dealing with those problems as they emerge over the course of the life of a young person. So um, just benefits everywhere. Thank you for reminding us, Georgie. And speaking of younger people, it's delightful to have Yasmin Poole here, who is a youth advocate, um, and we'd love to hear from her from the perspective of young women. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Yasmin Poole and I am a youth advocate. This morning we've mentioned communities like women, people with disabilities and young people. But these are not separate groups. From a young woman with a disability or an older woman from a refugee background, our realities are often very different from one another. Yet, historically the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, WGIA, has only had the power to measure the pay gap between men and women working full time. This misses a big part of the picture. What does the pay gap look like for diverse women across race, class, disability, and so on? If the data doesn't exist, it's very difficult for organizations to provide intersectional recommendations without a clear picture. I'm in favor of recommendation six in the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet's WGIA review report, which suggests WGIA conducts research on collecting future, further data around employees who are First Nations, culturally and linguistically diverse, and live with disabilities. Here, we can learn from Victoria's leading intersectionality work through the Gender Equality Commission led by Dr. Nikki Vincent. Alongside data, we need an intersectional framework across policy. Without a framework, diverse communities are not seen consistently. 
So for example, we can look to the previous Liberal government's budget where it mentioned migrant women under domestic violence actions, but not under supporting women at work, despite diverse communities being differently affected. We should learn from Canada's GBA Plus approach, which mandates government must consider how diverse groups of women, men, and gender diverse people may experience policies, programs, and initiatives differently. Finally, I also want to emphasize the importance of investment in cultural change, prevention, and safety in the workforce. Young women are watching when it comes to the Respect at Work report in Parliament. We're most at risk for sexual harassment and abuse, which is precisely why young women need a seat at the table in these discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin, as ever, absolute clarity and, um, and reminding us of all of these intersecting opportunities and good to bring it back to some of the recommendations before government at the moment with the Wajir Act. So thank you for doing that. Now we turn to Robin Denham, who is the chair both of the Australian Tech Council and chair of Tesla. Thanks, Sam, and uh, thank you for a fabulous panel this morning. I am uh, very inspired by all of the speakers and the comments after the, uh, the main panel as well, and thank you to Minister Gallagher as well. So I want to, um, I want to firstly uh, talk about the tech sector being fully supportive of actually uh, the goal of the summit, which is to reduce the gender pay gap. I think this is a very important uh, uh, statement to make out of uh, the summit. I would also like to acknowledge uh, the comments that were made last week by Sally McManus around um, the, the gender pay gap will only be uh, reduced once women-dominated uh, industries are paid adequately, and we've heard a lot about that this morning from uh, uh, panellists, but also that higher paid uh, male-dominated industries have, are more accessible to women. So I think those two points are the key as we move forward. If I look at the tech sector, it has huge benefits for women uh, that are working in it today. And as a reminder, there are 861,000 Australians that are working in tech today. One in 16 Australians are working in the tech sector. We have a goal of actually increasing that by, uh, to tw uh, in 2030 to 1.2 million. I also heard today some other numbers, which are there are 500,000 underutilised women in the workplace, and in the tech sector we need 300,000 additional tech sector workers to achieve our goals. So to me those two things are really, really uh, tied together. If you look at the benefits for women in the tech sector, it is one of the uh, most well-paid uh, uh, sectors. It's also one of the most secure. You are more likely to have a role in uh, tech if you've been in there uh, for a year of, that you're there 10 years later in the tech sector. Uh, it's also one of the most flexible jobs, and that's really important for regional and remote communities. You can work in the tech sector from anywhere. Um, we're also, it's also one of the most egalitarian uh, industries, in my experience. It, uh, the, the, the core tenant of innovation is actually diversity of thought, and diversity of thought comes in many guises. Women, uh, people with disabilities, different ethnicities, you, you really only create innovation when you have that diversity of thought around the table and uh, working on some of our most significant challenges as a society. The tech sector pay gap is one of the, the uh, smallest in uh, industries. It's, it's less than half of any industry in Australia today. So we need to do more, though, as an industry. Only one quarter of the workers that are in the tech sector today are women, and we need to increase that penetration rate to enable actually having higher paid jobs for women in Australia. We need to do that by, um, by growing the sector, as I mentioned before. The tech sector has been growing at roughly double the rate since 2005 of any other industry in Australia. It's growing, it, it has grown over that period of time by 66 per cent, 
and uh, the rest of the economy has grown by about 35 per cent. I am a tech optimist at heart. I believe that most of our problems uh, as a society can be cured by technology. I even believe that we are applying technology into some of the uh, women-dominated industries, like the care industry, will actually increase the productivity and enable us to pay higher wages in that sector as well. I also believe that we can uh, solve many of the other challenges around climate change and around uh, renewing the indus industrial base within Australia through using technology. I think everybody has a role to play. Government has a role to play by setting the right policy settings. Uh, the boards have a role to play. Every person in a board uh, today have a role to play in terms of uh, increasing the penetration of technology within your organisation and obviously um, ensuring that the right demographics are there in terms of how we fill those jobs across the nation. I also think that mums and dads have a huge role to play. The conversation in the panel around what you talk about in the around the kitchen table is really important in inspiring what the next generation of children in Australia will actually want to do as a career. And and to me, it's tech, tech, tech. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Your, your story from uh, growing up in a service station in the western suburbs of Sydney and to the elevation of your career through the United States and back here to the heights that you have led, I think have set the aspiration. You've used that position to encourage not just young women, but women and men, young men across the country to aspire to having a tech future. Um, and thank you for the work you do. Most recently, Chief Executive Women, um, inspired by Tanya Munro AC, who is this country's chief scientist for def the Defence Force and leads a lot of our work in AUKUS, coordinated a breakfast with the two other chief scientists of the AUKUS partners, who are also women. Um, and those three women talked, as Robin did, about the role modelling and the conversations for young people, particularly young women, but they did acknowledge that their careers had been, um, had been affected by the kinds of discrimination and hard paths that you've been hearing about today, but they'd got there. Um, these are the inspiring moments where we need to listen carefully and, and take those lessons. So thank you, Robin. We've got lots to, to do and it's part of our, our future, so thank you. Um, I know I've been receiving texts from a number of you in the audience wanting to make statements. You're all very important. You all have extraordinary contributions to make. I wish we had the whole day to do this, but of course we have five minutes left. So um, we will do more of this work in the panel, the task force, and I hope you ask those questions or contribute in the rest of the day, days ahead, because your comments will have equal impact on the topics ahead. But our final contribution from the floor today is the Victorian Premier, Daniel Andrews. Well, thank you very much, Sam. Can I too acknowledge that this is Aboriginal land uh, and that acknowledgement is very important. Very briefly, because if, I, if I'm a bit briefer, maybe somebody else might get a go. Uh, of all the things we'll talk about over these next two days, I think this issue uh, and unlocking the, uh, the amazing potential, the underutilised potential uh, of women who are because of a childcare system that doesn't work and an early childhood education system that has never been expanded to the level it ought be, uh, is perhaps the biggest lever that we can pull, the biggest contribution that we can make to economic prosperity, but also happens to be the right thing to do as well. But we should see it not as a deficit, we shouldn't see it as a problem, we shouldn't see it as just a matter of fairness. It's much bigger than that, as important as that is. I think that the best form of childcare is play-based learning, and that's why we are doubling and making free, completely free. Uh, 15 hours for three-year-olds, 30 hours for four-year-olds uh, also happens to have the benefit of meaning, meaning kids are more ready for school, life opportunities that, they'll benefit, that they will uh, be able to have over their journey, they will have the skills and the competence, the confidence as well that the economy will call for them to have when they become older. This is a well-proven case. You don't need to go through all the different stats, you don't need to go through all the different numbers, but I'll just make this point. Just in my state, there are 26,600 women who are completely locked out of the workforce because of the dynamic that I've just spoken about. Uh, that costs us $1.5 billion each and every year. That's just in our state, and that's just those who are completely locked out. Those who can't work the hours they want to work, well, that's a much bigger group uh, again. So, uh, uh, better early childhood education, dealing with childcare deserts, making childcare work for working families, 
has never been more important, not just because it's the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do. There's probably no greater economic opportunity for us as a nation than getting this right. Uh, so on that basis, to uh, Michelle's earlier point, we should just get on with it. Uh, and I did want to make the point, because uh, uh, often people are recognised and then often people are not. Sometimes one partner in a, in a relationship gets recognition and others don't. Danielle mentioned ore, and if this was an ore deposit, we would have dug it up long ago and we would have, and WA would have got all the royalties and the GST <laughs> deal and all of those things. But I would just say this. Uh, some people do see it this way. Uh, Nicola Forrest has been the greatest advocate for this reform of, of anyone. Uh, so its links to the mining sector are, are more, than just a, more, more than just a very good analogy from Danielle earlier on. Um, I hope we can all do this. I hope we can all see more and more women able to work the hours they want to work uh, and all the economic growth that will come from that. Uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, everyone's different. I think we all need to acknowledge, though, that this is a critically important way forward. Thank you, Premier. And um, fortunately, with this resource, it's not all located in one state or territory. So this resource is available to us across the country in great numbers, so everyone will benefit. Um, I, to take the Prime Minister's advocation for us all to, uh, to work in a spirit of cooperation, I would like to acknowledge Premier Perrottet and the work that was led on the, uh, the late, your last budget, where you committed $10 billion to childcare reform, both childcare workforce and the provision of the centres and the dealing with those deserts, um, and the fact that the two of you were able to come to an agreement on preschool and reform as two very different states, but big states. So that reform, I think, says we can do big things confidently um, in budgets and know that it will deliver great economic outcomes. So thank you, Premier Perrottet, as well. We have come to the end of your contribution and the panel's contribution. I'm just going to indulge you with one minute of trying to, rather than summarise, just a reflection, and then I will hand back to Minister Gallagher to, uh, to close this session out. And I think the way I'm looking at this, we don't need to keep going over the, the miserable, depressing data. Um, we should be all about the opportunity, as both the Prime Minister and the Treasurer encouraged us to this morning. I would encourage every participant in the room, in every session that you're going to be part of, um, those online who are watching this and hoping for us to be able to achieve big things, to genu genuinely engage with this issue. And I'm calling out to the men as well here. This shouldn't always be in the voice of women. This is a united call for big reform. When we talk about gender responsiveness analysis, that is a distinct capability that this country could grow, and we've seen it in the States. And it will mean looking at budgets, tax reform, policies, initiatives, through the lens and a simple question about whether the measure disproportionately discriminates or holds back women and girls, and conversely, if we did something different, would it advantage women and girls to deal with the gaps we've been talking about? It's not a simple exercise, but it goes to the heart of the Treasurer's ambition for a wellbeing budget about what we want to stand for. So I'm asking all of you, I think, through the course of the next day and a half, to have that in the back of your minds and take advantage of the fact that we're given the great privilege to lead off the summit on this vital topic. For a very, very long time in this country, women and girls have paid the cost and borne the consequences of us not dealing with this issue. Many, and I'm thinking of the women who are watching us today on the live stream, we can talk big numbers, we can talk about big reform, but we're talking about the lived experiences of the women and families who listen and watch us and hope for their aspirations and their hopes to be respected and for us to take that seriously and to exercise our privilege carefully. Those women across the country in their hundreds of thousands often are facing financial insecurity and poverty in their old age. It's no coincidence, given what we've heard this morning, the fastest growing group of homeless people in this country are women over 50. So hundreds of thousands of women around the country today may be looking at us, maybe millions, and asking us to actually do our job. You've heard us all say the time is, is right. We can do this. It's one of the greatest economic opportunities available to us today. But isn't it just the most important thing we can do to say to 52% of the population that you matter, you're relevant, you're respected, and you're part of this great opportunity to grow our economy. 
I just can't see how we don't do this, because if we continue to incrementalise, we will continue to see the staggering rates of poverty, of women kept out of our workforce, and we simply will not build a sustainable economy of the kind we've been hearing about in the ambition of our Prime Minister and Treasurer. So they're my personal reflections. They're the things we'll be looking at, I hope, in the task force for the Minister and for the Government. I hope you'll engage with that process too. And now I'd like to hand back to the Minister for Women, the Minister for Finance and the Public Service, Katie Gallagher. Uh, <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Sam, and I'm conscious of time, so I will be very brief, but I think, um, can I begin by thanking June, Emma, Leonora, uh, Sam and Michelle for uh, being on the panel and for the contributions from the floor, and I acknowledge there's a lot of people that want to provide um, uh, remarks on this subject, and over the next two days, I hope you all get the opportunity and we'll all be around. Um, to, to continue the discussions. I'm also really hopeful. I mean, I think um, we're all aware of the, the challenges, the problems, the problem identifications well understood in this room. And I feel like with more than 50% of the floor, if we had a vote today, we might pass a few resolutions like at, a, at an ALP conference. Uh, but the um, opportunities uh, to work together to deal with some of these and the urgency uh, I sense from um, the panelists and the feeling in the room to, to get a move on, to get cracking with some of this is really understood. Um, I, again, I think from the APS point of view, we need to lift our game and set the standard. Um, I think there's some things that obviously the task force will need to deal with and provide advice to government, um, but there's some simple things that we could all uh, take back a, and learn, and certainly the work that Kate Jenkins has done, um, you know, things that don't have a huge cost that, but would make a big difference like respect and safety for women, uh, and the numbers of women facing harassment, uh, and discrimination at work uh, remains unacceptable and we just have to get on with dealing th with that. Um, uh, I'm hoping that we'll get some really good outcomes from this, uh, from this um, session and uh, we'll be able to take that with us and implement um, alongside some of the commitments we've made uh, during the campaign, which are well underway. But I've certainly heard um, all of the issues raised today. There's a big opportunity, lots of challenges, but I also think we've just got to get cracking on it. So thanks very much, everyone, for participating. And thank you to everyone. That concludes uh, the morning session. Um, I just want to say that uh, on reflection sitting back there, not so long ago reaching consensus on an issue like this would have been a lot harder. So an amazing morning, um, a great privilege to witness the work you do and to hear your words. Uh, so thank you to, to all of you. Um, a truly inspiring way to open today. Uh, I have a quick bit of housekeeping. Please um, make a use of the time uh, in the break to um, touch base with the panel or anybody else you'd like to um, track down, of course, Sam, who's now the chair of the government's, government's Women's Equality Task Force, will be around. Um, in terms of the time, it's going to be quick. I will need uh, you back here at 10.25, panellists for the next session in particular. Uh, and I have one other point, but my phone isn't recognising my face. <laughs> I take my glasses off. There you go. Um, uh, uh, the Parliament House is now open to the public. I knew it was an important point. So we ask that you stay within the summit space in the Great Hall during the morning and afternoon, afternoon tea breaks um, to network and enjoy the catering. There is an option to take your meal out into the courtyards for some fresh air and daylight at lunchtime, we promise. So please enjoy the break. We'll see you back here in half an hour. But equally, it's really great that everyone's getting a chance to chat and have important discussions on the sidelines. I know, I know as um, the task force, uh, the Treasurer and the Prime Minister both 
made it clear that they wanted people to have a chance to speak to one another. Hence why we are going to try and run to time so that you can catch up in the lunch break as well. We also have the dinner this evening. It is so lovely to see many, so many faces that I recognise and haven't seen for a number of years. Or while you're just finishing and before the broadcast starts, uh, there is an app. Um, if you are interested in any of the speakers and knowing more about them, uh, I think there's a QR code will turn up at some point if you haven't already been given instructions. Uh, but if you, ah, there we are, magic. If you um, want to know a bit more about the people that are speaking today, you want to connect with them uh, after these two busy days, then please. Um, take the opportunity to look at the app and read the bios. Uh, and with that, I know there are a few stragglers moving around. I would urge you to quickly take your seats. This is a critical piece of this two days, this next session. And I really would like to give them as much time as possible to discuss the issues at hand. So if we just pause for a minute and we'll be 15 minutes to the broadcast. Hello and welcome back to the uh, Jobs and Skills Summit. Thank you for all taking your chairs quickly. The next panel is already in place, but let me explain. The topic is sustainable wage growth and the future of bargaining. It will, the, it will be opened by the Honourable Tony Burke, Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, and will be facilitated by my colleague and friend, Jamila Rizvi. Here's the Minister. Thanks very much, Helen, and I join in, in thanking Paul Gurua House for the warm uh, welcome we were given this morning. Well, welcome to the non-controversial part of the summit. <laughs> this is, we have two sessions consecutively, uh, first of all where we deal with job security and wages, uh, and then where we'll deal with the issues around safe, fair and productive workplaces. Effectively, these parts of the summit aren't starting now. They've been going for weeks. And I want to thank everybody who's been involved in the different conversations that, are, that have happened to try to make sure that in the course of the days leading up to the summit and hopefully in what's to follow now, uh, we get people as close as we possibly can so that we can then move forward with various government actions. Uh, you'll be aware that today we're not relitigating commitments that, that were made during the election campaign. So my department's already working, doing detailed work uh, on the different election commitments we already made with respect to getting wages moving, boosting job security, dealing with gender inequity and wage theft, restoring balance to our fair work institutions. But there are issues that have squarely been put on the table for today. Uh, the Prime Minister back during the election campaign, referred to the fact that we needed to get bargaining and enterprise agreements moving again and put them squarely on the agenda for today's summit. Uh, I, so additional mechanisms to fix bargaining, getting wages and productivity moving, 
closing loopholes that can drive wages down, including examples like a unilateral termination of agreements, closing the gender pay gap, creating safe and fair workplaces. The test for what's to follow isn't whether we all leave with identical views on the issues discussed, it's whether we get close enough to be able to proceed with bringing our workplace laws up to date with the needs of the modern economy so that business gets the workable system it needs and workers have the wage rises and fair conditions that they need. Workplace relations, at its best, it forges good relationships. I know sometimes we all instinctively retreat to our corners, but wherever we can foster cooperation, compromise and collaboration, when we do that, we deliver for every budget. Not just the budget that this building spends a lot of time uh, working through each time, that Jim has to deliver as treasurer, but also the budgets that keep businesses profitable and the household budgets that are discussed around the kitchen tables all around the nation. In the lead up to today, as well as the direct consultation that's been taking place, there's been a series of round tables that I've been directly involved with, both in my other portfolio with respect to arts workers, uh, with skills shortages and workplace issues there, both for the arts community and entertainment sector generally and for First Nations workers specifically, but also roundtables dealing with other areas of the workplace and particularly people seeking work. And with everything that is being said and sought uh, with respect to additional people being brought into the labour market, I do want to stress the strong call that's come from those roundtables that the employers of Australia also remember that within the workforce or seeking work right now, we have many people, including older workers, First Nations workers and people with disability, uh, who are here wanting to work and hoping for barriers to be removed. There was a further roundtable conducted with the road transport industry, uh, where representatives of the road transport industry, drivers, employers, operators, experts, and the Transport Workers' Union called for there to be a pathway to be able to set minimum standards to make sure that the transport industry is safe, sustainable and viable. The stronger and more constructive our workplace relations are, the better the outcomes will be for workers, for our communities, for our nation, for our employers. I want unions and businesses to come to the table with an open mind, a willingness to listen, to negotiate in good faith and to focus on solutions. I want to thank uh, Jamila and everybody from the panel for their involvement today. We have an opportunity for the sense of us feeling energised that we have today. We're to pass that on for a culture of good faith negotiation and dialogue in workplace relations. We start today with momentum. We have an opportunity now to take that the next stage. Ooh, thank you so much, Minister Burke. Everyone, my name is Jamila Rizvi. I'm the Deputy Managing Director at Future Women, and I'll be facilitating the next two sessions alongside the Minister. I'd also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people uh, and recognise Elders both past and present. We've got a lot to get on with in these two sessions. They're going to be absolutely packed, so I'm not going to waste time. I'd like to welcome Professor Shay McChrystal to set the scene and provide some context for the discussion that we are about to have. Shay McChrystal is a professor of labour law at the University of Sydney Law School. Please make her welcome. Thank you, Jamila. When the Fair Work Act was introduced in 2009, there was a generally optimistic outlook that the inclusion of good faith bargaining provisions and majority support determinations and the low paid bargaining stream would assist in reinvigorating collective bargaining. This optimism was misplaced. Collective bargaining coverage is in decline. Real wages are stagnating. Businesses' share of profit is increasing and the statutory tools designed to increase bargaining have withered on the vine. In terms of coverage, the decline is primarily a private sector phenomenon. In the public sector, coverage has remained relatively steady. However, since 2013, 
there has been an almost terminal decline in the lodgement and coverage of new enterprise agreements in the private sector. Coverage in that sector has almost halved, with every private sector industry experiencing marked decline and private sector coverage now sitting at just 11 per cent. In the private sector, the most dramatic declines have occurred in the retail trade, manufacturing, accommodation and food services sectors. Agreement making is still happening in some sectors, albeit at an historically low rate, construction, manufacturing and mining, for example. But it is critically endangered in highly feminised sectors like aged care and childcare in our services industries that we've heard about today. Reflecting this, the gender wage gap remains stubbornly stuck at 14.1 per cent, and average wage increases for women are persistently lower in industries where there are more women. In the same period, apologies, furthermore, small businesses with less than 20 workers have become virtually agreement free, with only 3 per cent of workers in firms this size covered by current enterprise agreements. In the same period, wages in Australia have stagnated. Annual wage increases in enterprise agreements have steadily declined in the last decade from about 4 per cent down to just 2.6 per cent in 2020 and 21. And since 2013, bargained outcomes have been marginally better than the minimum wage increase and about 1 per cent better than the economy-wide average. And the nexus between falling unemployment and wage growth and job creation and wage growth has broken. Neither falling unemployment nor job creation have pushed wages out of stagnation. So what has gone wrong? Well, there's many reasons for the failure of the Fair Work Act to revive collective bargaining. For example, public sector wage policies have depressed wage rates in the public sector. In 2021 agreement approvals, public sector wages in the federal system increased at an average of 2.1 per cent, while the minimum wage was increased at 2.5 per cent and private sector averages increased at 2.6 per cent. However, regulatory design of the Fair, Work, Work, ugh, the Fair Work Act is also at play. In particular, the Act creates a system of agreement making, not a system of bargaining. Agreements in this system can be created with no bargaining, no negotiation and no work rep worker representation. The levers within the system are entirely held by employers who initiate, control and finalise the agreement making processes. Unless employers are required to bargain through a majority support determination, which is increasingly difficult for workers to achieve, there is little incentive for them to engage in bargaining processes. The Act entrenches agreement making at the enterprise level, and this does not match up with 21st century business practices, where businesses separate out their processes into smaller and smaller enterprise units along supply chains and other methods. This atomises employees into smaller and smaller bargaining groups, impeding their capacity to achieve growth in wages at the bargaining table. And finally, there is no effective right to strike for workers under the Fair Work Act. There is no meaningful alternative, such as access to fair arbitration, and the agreement termination provisions have strengthened employers' hands at the bargaining table since the Orizon decision in 2015. How can our collective bargaining system be effective for workers in gaining a better share of the profits generated from their labour if they cannot effectively exercise power in those processes? This problem lies at the heart of our wages crisis and must be addressed. Thank you. Thank you to Professor McChrystal for so ably laying out some of the key issues that we're going to unpack over the next a little under two hours. It's now my pleasure to introduce the rest of our distinguished panel. Each of you are going to have a very luxurious four minutes to set out your vision for the future of bargaining and how we achieve sustainable wage growth. We'll start with Sally McManus, who is the 10th Secretary of the ACTU. I want to pay my respects to another old people and elders past and present and to all the elders I know that are here in this room. The Australian Union movement wants to see successful businesses, we do, but we also want to see the living standards of all Australians to rise. 
we're painfully aware that we're experiencing the largest real wage cut in our history, and that's after a decade of, of wage stagnation, and workers face real wage cuts in the years to come. Yet many businesses are doing well, and some are posting very healthy profits. This is not a future Australians would choose for themselves or for the next generation. People see this unfairness, and we can do so much better. Falling living standards should not be acceptable to any of us, and it should be our shared objective at this summit to turn it around. I want to be clear about the union movement's ambitions. We want to see sustainable pay increases so that working people's pay keeps up with the cost of living and productivity increases. We also want the work of people like care workers and educators pro properly respected and valued. For this to be occur, we need to modernise our collective bargaining system. We must have a system that's simple, that's fair, accessible and does the job of getting wages moving. Employers and unions agree that bargaining is not simple and it should be. There are too many hurdles, many for employers and even more for workers. We should aim to remove as many of them as possible. The only rules that should exist are those that are necessary to ensure fairness. Most employers and unions can just get on with the job of bargaining and should be able to do this without rules res restricting how and what they talk about and get in the way at every step. They should be able to commence bargaining and, when done, simply lodge an agreement with the independent umpire ap applying the better off overall test. This test can be made simpler without compromising on fairness. Simplicity in bargaining can be delivered by empowering the Fair Work Commission. The Commission could assist in resolving issues for those employers and unions who need it, for example, in situations when bargaining has gone on for too long or where either party is acting unfairly. In strengthening the role of the Commission, we can achieve a system that's fair, efficient and simple for the vast majority of employers and unions who bargain, while delivering fairness and efficient bargaining for the mi minority who need assistance. Collective bargaining has become extremely lopsided. This is why wage outcomes are so low and so few agreements are now reached. A bargaining system should aim to facilitate bargaining between equal parties, and the Fair Work Commission should play a role in ensuring this. Lops lo loopholes which have made bargaining completely unfair must be closed. Employers should not be able to threaten to cancel agreements as a bargaining tactic. Employers should not be able to take their own forms of extreme industrial action, like locking out workers for weeks in response to minor forms of industrial action by workers. For collective bargaining to thrive, we also need to invest in supporting and skilling those who do it. Negotiating, collaborating, representing, problem solving, and creative thinking are high-level skills essential to building positive work, work cultures and working together to increase productivity. For too long, productivity has just been a code word for cost-cutting and driving down wages. Cost-cutting and competitive approaches, let's face it, are easy. But harder, but, but real productivity by innovating and collaborating is much harder, and we need to invest in it. As a country, we must focus on the latter. We must focus on this. And this means we must commit to skilling up and supporting the people who need to do it, and they are in the workplace. Our current bargaining system is a one-size-fits-all, and these days it hardly fits anyone. For 30 years, the system has stayed pretty much the same while the economy has changed dramatically. As we've heard this morning, 30 years on, the economy looks totally different. It's now dominated by the service industries. Those workers have been totally failed by, by this old system. We need, a new, we need new modern options for bargaining alongside enterprise bargaining to get wages moving. Multi-employer or sector bargaining makes sense for so many and it's necessary to get wages moving. We cannot afford inaction on wages growth. We can't afford to lack courage or to waste a day. Every day wasted is a day Australians and their families continue to go backwards, continue to cut back spending and continue to limit their dreams and their ambitions. The current and future, current and future Australians deserve so much better. 
let's get the job done. Thank you so much, Sally, for laying out your vision for a modernised collective bargaining system. I'm now going to turn to Alexi Boyd, who is the CEO of COSBOA. Thanks very much. COSBOA has been involved in consultations with government, other employer bodies, other stakeholders and, importantly, its members for many years in relation to industrial relations. It's an important policy area for COSBOA and small business. Having said that, it's traditionally a difficult policy area to achieve any change. Achievements are small, incremental and take time. Everyone wants to see easy job creation. Employers engage employees on the basis of mutual benefits to both parties. The employer benefits from the employee's skills and expertise, and the employee benefits financially. While we may be in a period of record unemployment now, that is unlikely to last forever. It's therefore in our best long-term interest to reform the system to remove as many barriers to employment as possible. Right now, the industrial relations system is intimidating, the complexity serving as a disincentive to employment. We want to see the system be simple enough so it can be navigated by someone who is actually employing for the very first time. Small businesses and their industry associations have been looking for a way forward to suit their needs in the modern workplace. One solution might be a framework or a template to get the discussion started with employees around productivity, offers in contracts to attract talent and navigating working from home, for example. So if the one-size-fits-all approach doesn't work and we all agree that the current system is broken, what's the solution? Well, the solution is to start talking. That's why we have agreed to come together through a memorandum of understanding, to explore ways to simplify, reduce complexity and with the industrial relations system that will enable small businesses to employ more people grow their business and reduce non-compliance. Why is this different from the past? Because this is the start of a conversation based on the reality of 2022, with a new and renewed sense of purpose, one that puts small businesses and their workers first. COSBOA and its members are not in support of any measures that would force, mandate or remove the autonomy of small businesses to decide their future. We're not interested in a model that's sector-wide and compulsory. To clarify accusations made by others, COSBOA does not believe nor will in any way propose unionisation of small business. We're seeking to develop pro proposals to create flexibility and productivity in the workplace. An important caveat is that everything on the table is opt-in. We have no proposal, nor will we accept that it's appropriate to unionise small business. That's not in any of our proposals. We need to examine the IR system first, then consider how to make options like multiplier employer agreements accessible for those who want to use them. But that might not be right for every small business. COSBOA members tell us that certain industries are perfectly happy with their awards, while others feel that a framework to support them in navigating theirs might be helpful. We hope to find consensus on aspects of IR reform which are currently unmanageable. This includes examining the boot test. We're not going to resolve the problems in the IR system in these two days, nor in these two hours. Rather, it's about seeking principles to improve engagement, simplicity and increase productivity and compliance for the benefit of small business and their workers. It's about resetting the conversation so that small businesses is at the centre of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution, Alexi. We're now going to turn to Tim Reid, who is the President of the Business Council of Australia. Thank you, Jamila, and it's great to be here with you all. I'd also like to start by paying my respects to the traditional landowners, the Ngunnawal people, uh, elders past and present. Uh, Prime Minister, thank you for pulling this gathering together and Treasurer for your hard work. Uh, the Business Council enters today in a spirit of cooperation, um, of one of a solutions orientation, uh, because we do believe that it is by Australians coming together that we will be able to achieve our best. It goes without saying that uh, workplace relations, the IR system overall, has been a difficult conversation over the past decade. We've made very little progress. In fact, in areas we've gone backwards. That is because at times, uh, I think, Prime Minister, you used the expression, the old playlist um, that you wanted left at home. 
we seem to have reverted to corners and seem to have reverted uh, to old thinking. But I think if we reposition this and think about the objectives of the parties here, certainly we speak at the BCA of our desire for this conversation to be about driving national prosperity and ensuring that that prosperity is shared with all Australians. We want real wages growth. We want real wages to grow sustainably and consistently over time. And we do believe that the IR system should be able to contribute to real wages growth. And I would like to thank Sally and her colleagues because over the past few weeks, in fact over years, uh, we have been able to have very productive conversations around how we might be able to achieve that. And in listening to Paul's welcome to country this morning, I think he used the word respect more than any others. And I think that is what is needed in this conversation going forward. Uh, so there are three notes that I would like to make, and um, I did have a speech prepared, uh, but this morning the Treasurer and Danielle more or less covered most of what I wanted to say, so I'll make this brief. Since Federation, the Productivity Commission has determined that pretty much all real wages growth has come from productivity improvements. Uh, in the note that the Treasurer sent around in advance of this gathering, he made a similar observation over the past 30 years. So if we really want to sustainably get real wages growing, we need to consistently get productivity improvements. Productivity is driven when we have the ingenuity of people combined with investment in tools, skills and capability to innovate. And it is only that process of innovation that will drive productivity. And so the question becomes, how does an industrial relations system support, enhance and accelerate innovation. We believe that happens primarily at the enterprise level. The way in which our economy is structured is capital comes together, people come together, processes, investment in skills, managerial capability all come together at the firm level. And indeed, if you think about breakthroughs that we've had, big breakthroughs and small ones, it tends to be by people getting around a table and collaborating inside that framework. We have a system for bargaining within enterprises, and unfortunately, it is broken. There are different models around the world, but the one that we have used, and the one that has worked at times, is enterprise bargaining. Today, non-managerial employees who are paid under an EBA are paid $100 more per day than those that aren't. That's $25,000 a year. But over the last decade, the number of employees covered under an EBA has declined by a million. Why is that? Well, Sally ran through lots of the reasons in her opening comments. The system is complex. The system is based on legalities. The system is difficult to navigate. And frankly, therefore, businesses are opting out of using it and going back to the rigid con confines of awards. We have to be able to do better than that. We need to make the bargaining system simpler. We need to make it more accessible. We do believe that the concept of the boot, ensuring that outcomes through bargaining are that every employee, all employees, are better off in an overall sense, is an important baseline. We do believe that the primacy of the parties negotiating has to be taken into account, that we can't have systems where months of negotiation take place and then at the last minute they get blown up by an outside organisation. And we do believe it's important that at the end there is a single instrument so that businesses, once they have negotiated, can rely on that instrument rather than layering it on top of others. Moving on from enterprise bargaining, uh, we do believe that we need to have a conversation about award simplification. By that, we don't mean reducing the number of the 122 awards that exist, but simply going through them and making sure that the out-of-date definitions, the out-of-date terms and clauses are removed and that they are presented in a way that everyday people, workers and employers can understand because I don't know how many of you have read an award. Not many, I 
not seeing many hands go up, but they are extraordinarily complex and difficult to navigate. And the third thing I would say, and this feeds very much on from the panel before, the IR system has to address the gender pay inequalities that are embedded in our society today. I, I thought it was um, enlightening, uplifting um, to hear about the conversation about that having to go back to the very culture that we bring, our mindsets that we bring to workplaces, because I think fundamentally that is where the problem is. I don't think it's in bargaining per se, but I think there could be solutions through the industrial relations system that addresses that. But I do think it's going to take leadership from all of us to ensure that we address the mindset that gets brought to work, not just the legal frameworks that are negotiated through a bargaining system. Um, so look, perhaps I'll end there and, and hand any other time that I have to others. But I would end on just saying that from the Business Council's perspective, we are here, we're here to collaborate, uh, we are here to try and find solutions, and I'm actually pretty optimistic that together we will be able to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim, and welcome to a lot of very big tables for some collaboration. Uh, we're now going to turn to Anthony Forsyth, who is a distinguished professor in the Graduate School of Business and Law at RMIT University. Thank you. Thank you, Jamila, and thank you to the government for recognising the contribution of academic experts and including us in, or some of us in the summit. So what is a main reason the current enterprise bargaining system isn't working? It's because the Fair Work Act sets up the possibility of bargaining for agreements, but is quite indifferent as to whether that actually happens. In a lot of workplaces, there's no negotiation. The employer just puts out a proposed agreement to employees to vote on. The legislation doesn't sufficiently promote collective bargaining, that is, a genuine negotiation over wages and conditions between employers and the representatives of workers. Boosting real wages requires a fundamental redesign, and a key reform is to move beyond enterprise-level bargaining. International evidence shows that countries with sectoral or multi-employer bargaining have much higher rates of agreement coverage, between 50 and 90 per cent of the workforce, than countries like ours with single-employer bargaining at enterprise level. And when we look around the world, we find industry bargaining mostly in European IR systems, and they vary from the highly centralised systems of France and Italy, where agreements are made at the sectoral or national level, to countries like the Netherlands, Denmark, Norway and Sweden, where sectoral agreements set minimum standards but provide scope for firm level bargaining over their application, and then a country like Germany, where sector-wide agreements include opt-out clauses allowing firm level deviations. Now, these national collective bargaining systems are products of each country's economic culture. Most of them are founded in various forms of social partnership, so quite different to our industrial relations traditions. And they were developed over decades, and we can't just copy them. What we need to do is add the options of bargaining across industries or multiple employers to the existing system. Limiting agreements to a single business entity that directly employs the workforce completely ignores how businesses have evolved since the early 90s when enterprise bargaining was designed, through labour hire, franchising, outsourcing and other business models. And what these do is they enable lead firms to exert significant economic power over the wages and conditions of workers down the chain but avoid ever having to negotiate with them. So multi-employer bargaining is needed to bring those lead firms in sectors like food production and logistics and retail to the bargaining table. Employers can engage in multi-employer bargaining under the Fair Work Act now, so why not workers and unions? It should also be possible for workers to bargain for an agreement covering all or part of an industry. And this is an even more urgently needed fix because it would enable low-paid workers, as we've heard today, mostly women, in aged care, childcare and disability support to bargain for above-award conditions. 
there is a low paid bargaining scheme in the Fair Work Act. Uh, it's proved to be completely useless for these workers. There are just too many legal hurdles. And that is why we've only seen one case using those provisions in 13 years. While there are a lot of differences uh, between businesses in a sector like disability support, they have common interests. They provide similar services and they operate under federal government funding arrangements. Those kinds of workers should have the option of a sector-wide agreement negotiated by all relevant parties, including the funder. And finally, we should note that New Zealand is introducing a form of industry bargaining through their Fair Pay Agreements Bill currently before their parliament. It's a little different to what's being considered here in that it's replacing the award floor that was removed under the New Zealand system in 1991. But it is an example of a country like ours with a similar industrial relations tradition moving in the direction of the mature collective bargaining systems in Europe by offering agreement options at a range of levels. So we can learn a lot from these overseas systems and experiments, but we have to come up with our own formula to widen access to wage increases for Australian workers. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Forsyth, and, uh, importantly for that international perspective as well, and thank you to everyone for your opening remarks. Already I think we are seeing some areas of commonality which is encouraging and there's a clear desire to work together. Several members of the panel, you'll have noted, spoke about the importance of creating a modern framework which is both simple, heard that word a lot, and fair, um, a framework which ensures all workers and businesses can negotiate in good faith for agreements that benefit them. I think we've also heard about uh, access, access challenges, including for women, uh, which contribute to the gender pay gap. I'd now like to hand the microphone over to our delegates who have prepared, prepared statements and some questions to read. I want to remind uh, everybody to please keep your contributions to three minutes, or Helen is over there and she's ruthless with the button that turns off the mic. Uh, our first speaker is Dr Charlene Leroy-Dyer Leroy from the University of Queensland Business School. Wari Mingani, Nea Charlene Leroy-Dyer. Garrigal Awabakal Darek Wiradjuri. I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people, the traditional owners of this land, and pay my respects to Elders past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Sovereignty was never ceded. This is, was, and always will be Aboriginal land. On the 30th of August, we held a First Nations Employment Alliance Summit here in Canberra to feed into this summit. The First Nations Employment Alliance is made up of First Nations employment practitioners, academics and unionists. I'd been given the mandate of relaying to this forum what changes we would like to see in relation to sustainable wage growth and the future of bargaining for First Nations perspectives. There was two main themes that came out of our summit. Secure ongoing real employment and eliminating racism in the workplace. In relation to secure ongoing employment, we would like to see a genuine commitment to improving skills and job prospects in rural and remote areas, including ongoing full-time employment, not just 26 weeks from wage subsidies. More jobs and meaningful training opportunities in a wide spectrum of industries and positions. More jobs in remote communities. First Nations employment being prioritised across public and private sectors, and a definition of casual employment which limits insecure work in all industries and communities, including for those who educate and teach us. In relation to racism in the workplace, we would like to see a racism-busting agenda spearheaded by the ACTU and the union movement that ensures responsibility for tackling racism is shared by all, employers, government, government, business and sector bodies and the public. Racism needs to be seen as a genuine work health and safety issue. We would like changes to the inherent unsafe reporting mechanisms around racism, changes to recruitment to eliminate racism, 
And one huge issue for our mob is that we experience racism in the workplace. Nothing is done about it, so we leave jobs. And this perpetuates the welfare mentality that we are forced to be in. In terms of bargaining, we would like to see Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander employment targets at all levels of organisations in all collective agreements and awards. Cultural clauses in agreements and awards. Paid cultural leave. Aboriginality as a genuine occupational qualification. And cultural loading for the work that we do in workplaces above and beyond what's in our position descriptions. The NTEU is already a leader in bargaining for these outcomes within universities, and there's no reason these can't be replicated in other workplaces around the country. We commend this government's approach to replace the punitive and racist CDP with a commitment to real jobs and real wages, and with workplace conditions and superannuation. We would like to see the government take the same approach in regard to other First Nations employment barriers, as I've mentioned. Given what I've just outlined as being priorities for First Nations workers, we would like to see this government, employers, interest groups and others work with us to bring about these important changes so that we have secure employment, dignity and respect in our workplaces. The time for platitudes is past. It is now time for action. I would like to have tangible outcomes to report back to the First Nations Summit on what this Jobs and Skills Summit has delivered and will deliver for First Nations peoples. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leroy Dyer. Innes Willock, CEO of the Australian Industry Group, is up next. Hello. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, AI Group very much welcomes the opportunity to participate in this summit, as well as many of the conversations and discussions that have preceded it and no doubt will come after. As, we, as we've had laid out today, we all know there are problems with the bargaining process and AI Group is committed to working to improving the system. In this process, there should be scope for both employers and employee representatives to work constructively on improving the system, even when we have different perspectives. As the Prime Minister said this morning, the issues at hand are too important for us to remain in the trenches. Let's look at the Fair Work Act, which was legislated by an earlier Labor government. And a key object of it is, quote, achieving productivity and fairness through an emphasis on enterprise level collective bargaining. That has been the bedrock of policy for a very long time, something that former Prime Minister Paul Keating continually talked about. We should not lose sight of that. But very clearly, as has been outlined today, the system is not working as intended or as it should. Industry consistently calls out um, the barrier to bargaining uh, as being that the system is overly complicated and technical. They point to the problematic way the better off overall test is applied. Agreement making should be a simple process for everyone not the minefield, and it is a minefield that it currently is. We would argue that with sensible reform rather than radical change, the system can once again play a much greater role in delivering the objectives we all want of higher productivity and better pay for employees. We have proposed serious solutions directed at what are notorious problems. The government has been, has been developing principles to facilitate engagement with representatives of employers and employees in the context of this debate, and we agree with much of the content. We all want the system to enable parties to reach agreement that see employees being paid higher wages that can be sustained through real productivity improvements. Leading into this summit, there have been calls from the ACTU for a system that enables a greater level of multi-employer or, sect or sector-based 
bargaining. Let me just say we're not convinced of the need for radical or risky reform. Part of the issue is that the ACTU to date has provided little detail on their proposal and employers around the country are deeply concerned about what may be envisaged for a number of reasons. There are questions, as Anthony has outlined, around what is multi-party bargaining in the Australian context? What is defined as small business? What are the geographic regions covered? All those sort of issues would need to be discussed and worked through. But there is real concern that such a proposal will risk exposing our community to crippling industrial action across crucial sectors of our economy, and nobody wants that. Secondly, the proposal will foreseeably detract from what is important, enterprise-level bargaining. Real productivity gains are best achieved by a focus on agreements reached at the workplace or, or, or organisational level. And thirdly, no case has been made for why any change is needed to the existing multi-employer bargaining laws, but we can have that conversation and that should be part of the conversation. We need to have a starting point, we believe, an assumption in this debate that what we need is not radical reform, but a good look, a serious repair of the system. We need a modern and open economy as a country that, with a workplace relations framework that encourages fairness, flexibility and productivity. We also need a system that will help us respond to the current challenges ranging from global instability, labour shortages and the ongoing recovery from the pandemic. And industry stands ready to assist, ready, willing, able to participate in the conversations about how to move the system along to achieve those goals in all our interests. Thank you. Ines, thank you for your contribution. Now we'll go to Andrew McKellar, CEO of the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jamila, and also thank you very much uh, to all members of the panel for their uh, contributions uh, today. Uh, I would start by saying that there are different views and data about the correlation between productivity growth and, and wages performance uh, in the recent past. There are different views on that. But there's no disagreement from business that when productivity goes up, wages should go up as well. And we have to design a system that ensures that we are facilitating that outcome to occur. There's also, I think, a consensus between employers and unions that our bargaining system is withering. We've heard it several times uh, today. Uh, we have to restore the link between productivity and bargaining and wages. Uh, we've heard that very much today. In recent days, I think we've also heard and seen that there are some distractions uh, about proposals uh, for a return to industry-wide bargaining. Uh, and that has quickly morphed into a push for more multi-employer agreements, again, something that's been referred to. I would assert that one of the overriding priorities must be given to fixing the Fair Work Commission's unnecessarily complex uh, and technical agreement-making uh, pro uh, process. And I agree with what I heard Tim Reid say on this and also my colleague uh, Ennis a moment ago that productivity is fundamentally driven at the enterprise level, and that's where the focus uh, of our bargaining system, our agreement-making system, should remain. Um, if we're going to reinvigorate and restore confidence in the bargaining uh, system, then the better off overall test, its operation, its interpretation, has to be addressed. That's a fundamental reform that's got to be on the table. Can I acknowledge, uh, in particular, I think, the work of Minister Burke uh, and his team uh, and his senior departmental officials uh, in the lead up to this uh, summit because behind the scenes they've been working very assiduously, carefully to call in the submissions, the views of business, the views of industry. I think they've worked to close the gap, to build a very significant unanimity. Uh, and I think there is, uh, I think, a very clear agreement that we have scope to make progress out of this summit uh, and in the period going ahead. 
I think I would finish by just saying that the questions that we have to answer uh, at this point in time is how can we fix those core problems in our bargaining system uh, for businesses and organisations of all sizes, small, medium and large. Uh, there is a prospect of agreement uh, beyond the broad principles that we're talking about here today. The devil is in the detail, but I think business and unions are clearly committed to bridge that gap and to achieve that outcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for that contribution, Andrew. We'll now go to Professor Sarah Charlesworth from RMIT. Thank you. Uh, I'd like first to uh, acknowledge the um, traditional owners of this land, the Ngunnawal people, uh, on whose unceded lands we're meeting today, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to First Nations people here. Anthony has spoken to the abject failure of the current low pay bargaining stream provisions. And there's no doubt in my mind that reform to the Fair Work Act to provide for sectoral or at least multi-employer bargaining will be beneficial, particularly for low paid workers in the care economy. I want to make just two points. Given that any such collective agreements would sit on top of the relevant award provisions, it's absolutely vital that those awards, including skill classifications and pay structures, as well as crucial working time arrangements, provide a robust platform from which to bargain. And I might be, might be on a unity ticket with Tim here. Awards in uh, many feminised sectors, uh, including care, are hollowed out. Most have very rudimentary and compressed skills classification structures on which wages are based. And that is also another element that contributes to the gender pay gap. In many cases, there are only sense difference in the pay rates in any progression up really foreshortened classification structures. So sectoral or multi-employer bargaining really needs to be built on a robust award base if it's actually going to lead to improved wages and conditions, particularly for women. There are examples of successful sectoral bargaining in, um, in, in care uh, work, which I think provides some confidence about positive outcomes in Australia. For example, in the aged care sector in the Netherlands, collective agreements negotiated by the relevant unions there cover almost half a million uh, workers in nursing homes, home care, including that provided through local authorities. Those unions have just recently secured a 5% wage increase over two years with an additional 1.25% for workers on the lowest salary scales covered by that agreement. They've also, I think, really crucially, one increases in paid travel expenses and additional provisions to reduce workloads and improve rostering for workers. Close to home, the Australian Services Union in Victoria, in a form of multi-employer bargaining, if you like, has effectively bargained for better wages and conditions for home care workers across a number of local governments. These agreements not only provide for much higher wages than paid to most home care workers, who have to rely on the very meagre provisions of the Social Community Home Care and Disability Services Award. They also have decent working time minima, including paid travel time, uh, which, which is absolutely vital for both decent and secure jobs and to the provision of good quality care for aged care clients. So legislative change to provide options for meaningful multi-employer or sector-wide bargaining that can deliver not only better wages, but also better working time provisions is crucial for workers in the feminised ECEC, disability and aged care sectors, especially if those amendments work to bring the main funder of those services, the federal government, to the bargaining table. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Professor Charlesworth. Next we'll go to Jared Dwyer from the SDA, who's the National, National Secretary there. Uh, thank you, and the SDA covers workers in retail, uh, warehousing and fast food. Uh, I've got a question directed to Professor Forsyth, but firstly I'd like to make a, a call to everyone in this room. We've heard this morning that care should be viewed as an investment, an economic enabler. And my ask is that everyone here holds on to that thought when we leave this forum tomorrow. Now to my question. The current IR and bargaining system lacks collective enforcement mechanisms to address systemic issues such as discrimination, 
on the basis of family and caring responsibilities. And this severely impacts rostering opportunities and earnings. We also need collective mechanisms to address sexual harassment and the undervaluing of work, particularly in feminised industries. So, Professor Forsyth, could you please uh, tell us what changes you'd support to the Fair Work Act that might address these concerns? Thanks for the question, Jared. And look, the main thing I would do would be to open up what we can bargain about. We have a system that limits what can be included in agreements, um, including restrictions uh, that might be placed on employers utilising some of the forms of outsourced labour that I talked about in my four-minute talk. Um, but when it comes to addressing issues around family responsibilities, that should be um, something that we can bargain about. Um, and if that means family-friendly rosters, if it means gender quotas, um, there's a decision of the Fair Work Commission from a few years ago that said bargaining over gender quotas was not a permitted matter that you could include in an enterprise agreement. That has to change. And again, looking at the European systems that I talked about, um, they don't limit what you can bargain about. And just overnight, I picked up a report from the European Foundation for Living and Working Conditions that talks about the adaptive role of collective bargaining in European countries in addressing workforce challenges of exactly the same nature as we're talking about here today. Um, the green transition, digitalisation of work, skills and training, and the ageing workforce and demographic change. So we should be able to bargain in our collective agreements around all of those issues. So a fundamental limitation in the Fair Work Act needs to be revi revisited as part of this reform process. Alexi, did you want to jump in? I would actually. Oh, hello. Hello. Well, we've confused the microphone, people. Give it <laughs> two seconds. There you go. Um, actually, just wanted to, to raise something. This was an email that I received um, in the last few days, and I think it summarises um, what you were saying just then quite nicely. Um, Adam, that's his real name. I truly believe there is a need for greater flexibility in small businesses, operators, and their employees. And this is an eye for one would welcome the change, and most of those in the small business sector that I know would also welcome it. Our employees are employed under the Hair and Beauty Award. All our employees are female, and a significant portion are married or single mothers working part time. They're comfortably committed to a certain number of hours per week. However, they often seek additional hours to meet cost of living expenses or to save for a holiday or life events. We would like to offer more hours they are seeking. However, these hours currently must be paid at overtime penalty rates of time or double time and a half, depending on the additional hours. The cost to our, to, for our business to adopt these penalty rates is higher than the cost of employing a different casual employee, which is disruptive. The imposition of penalty rates makes it commercially unviable for us to provide more hours. Instead, we're forced to engage with casual employees, which complicates the system and means we have to engage with more more workers, which is further complicating and adding extra stress to the small business employer. I think that uh, sums it up neatly in terms of the single small business owner who feels that that inflexibility for where they're working now and into the future doesn't exist. Thank you, Alexi, and thank you to all of our contributors today, including from the floor. Uh, we appreciate uh, your insights and your preparedness to engage. Minister Burke will respond to the ideas and the perspectives that have been raised in this session at the end of both of the workplace relations sessions. So for now, could you please put your hands together for our excellent panel? And if our next workplace relations panel want to make their way up to the stage, we will move into creating safe, fair and productive workplaces.
You can keep the same glass. That's fine. I'll grab one of those. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce our second workplace relations panel. Again, uh, please, uh, we will hear from each of them individually. I'm going to ask you to please keep your comments to the four minutes again. I really do mean it, though we are keeping excellent time. We are going to start with Wan Tran, who is Principal Solicitor at the Young Workers Centre. I wish to pay my deep respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people. This always was, always will be Aboriginal land. A young worker starts their working life. They start out in retail or at a cafe or as a labourer on a construction site, maybe as a hairdresser, a mechanic, a software engineer. They start off as a casual worker, but they turn up week after week, to the same couple of shifts. Maybe they start an apprenticeship. I wish they knew about bargaining, but instead they beg. They beg to go to trade school. They beg to get some more training. They beg for time off because they're sick. They beg for their pay to be the minimum or they beg for particular equipment because they're vision impaired. And they get told, no, it's too busy. You cannot go to trade school. Or maybe, OK, but you don't get paid for your days off. Or, I never did. I cannot believe you're even asking. You millennials are such an entitled bunch. Your attitude stinks, so go away and don't come back. And that's if they're lucky. Lucky because they worked for maybe enough hours to earn maybe enough to live on. Lucky because they didn't get electrocuted or fall off a roof. Lucky because they didn't get leered at or assaulted by a supervisor or manager. And so their employment ends. Then they learn there's a lengthy process to try to get any money back. And that's pretty much what it comes down to, money. They can forget about fixing any of the other things. They write to their boss and they hear nothing. They ask for help from the Fair Work Ombudsman and they hear very little. They learn that taking it to court might cost as much, if not more, than they're actually owed. Maybe they'll find a community legal centre, and probably, though, they won't, because there simply aren't enough of us, and we simply do not have the resources to help everyone who needs it. And if they do start a court case, well, after months, if they're lucky, but years most of the time, they'll get a bit of paper that says their boss did owe them that money. And then they discover the boss, who they thought was a real person, was a legal fiction, a corporate entity, and it no longer exists. And that's the end of the road. It should not be like this. Everyone, and especially young people starting out in the workforce, should have decent, secure, well-paid jobs. Let's regulate work employee, independent contractor, permanent, casual, fixed term, on demand, gig, whatever. Let's start with the principle. You do the same work, you get the same pay. Let's pay attention to emerging employment practices and make sure that they're not crafted to evade obligations. Let's look at what keeps workers safe and in their jobs and structure our laws to enable that. Let's make sure every worker can take time off if they need it, and that casual workers have a right to take time off when they're sick. Let's make sure wages allow workers to live. Young workers' pay should not be related to their age, but to the skill of the work they perform. And pay should not be related to disability. Let's get rid of the supported wage system. It doesn't work to get people with disabilities into the workforce. Instead, 
It undermines our safety net, and it enables us to treat people as second class. Apprentices also have low minimum legal wages because they're supposed to be trained in a skilled trade for life. Let's make sure they actually get that training. Employers need to be properly scrutinised to ensure they're treating and paying their apprentices correctly. And if they're not, ban them. Let's set up a really simple and fast system for workers to recoup their unpaid entitlements. The Andrews government in Victoria has implemented one, and we need one federally that works in conjunction with it. So much of this could have been sorted out from the beginning. Let's get workers' representatives back into the workplace to check compliance. Workers' representatives, unions, act for their members. They also act for a system whereby minimum standards are met so that people can help the economy thrive. It's not just wages that union can check. They can make sure workers are safe at work. They can be there to support workers who are being bullied and harassed. Unions can solve problems in the workplace that just cannot be fixed after the fact. We have a huge opportunity and so much work to do. I hope we can do it. Thank you so much, Juan, for those passionate words on behalf of young Australian workers. Paul Zara is the CEO of the Australian Retailers Association, and you're up next. Jamila, thank you very much. Uh, as a retailer, I'd like to acknowledge the First Nations peoples as Australia's first traders, and I pay re my respect to elders past and present. So we, we say never waste a crisis at the ARA, and we believe the current labour crisis provides the opportunity to make a powerful shift towards safer, fairer and more productive workplaces. As we emerge from a pandemic which has both challenged and strengthened our teams and called many practices into question, there's never been a more important time for reassessment, innovation and a true win-win approach. The retail industry is Australia's largest private employer, employing one in ten Australians, and we are ready, willing and able to play our part. There will be plenty of proposals up for debate over the next two days, and the ARA, along with many other groups, have put forward their suggestions to government. Our initiatives revolve around mobilising more mature age workers, improving the affordability and flexibility of childcare, increasing investment in retail traineeships to future-proof the sector and provide more employment opportunities, pursuing greater flexibility in part-time work arrangements for both employer and employee, seeking national consistency around workforce participation for teenagers, and increasing the skill migration intake with a focus on hard-to-fill digital and data roles. We don't expect consensus on everything, but let's not lose sight of the bigger picture and the reason why we are here. Let's commit ourselves to bold reforms that we can accelerate our economic recovery. Focusing on today's panel and starting with safe workplaces, it goes well beyond managing physical hazards or implementing a zero tolerance approach to bullying or harassment. Employees want to be safe and feel comfortable in an environment where they can be their true selves. This is particularly true of younger workers, many of whom will have their first job in retail or hospitality and have grown up expecting to bring their full selves to everything they do in life. Or women who have to have, make their families invisible just to keep their jobs or to get ahead. We must improve diversity, equality and inclusion, not just for this younger generation and women, but right across our workforce. Fairness at work can be defined by a win-win approach having a sense of mutual obligation and ensuring there is a mutual, mutual benefit between employer and employee. Within retail, we're paying a close attention to the workforce shifts that have emerged from the pandemic. COVID created enormous shifts in the way our teams view their work and how they, how they want to work. It shouldn't take a great resignation to highlight the need to respond to these changing expectations and needs. And indeed, many in our retail community have been rising to the challenges of increased demand for flexible work environments and more employee benefits. In this year's annual wage review, we did support and recommend a wage increase for our people. 
However, it needs to be sustainable and aligned to an underlying rate of inflation. We saw this as a fair compromise between the cost of living pressures for employees and the higher cost of doing business for our members. We knew this was also a win-win because a high proportion of higher wages come back into retail as discretionary spending. With so many Australians starting their working life in retail or hospitality, our sector also has an important role to play in setting expectations about fair and equitable work relationships that we hope remain as a benchmark through someone's entire career. Finally, on productive workplaces, in our wage review submission, we said that any increase in wages above underlying inflation would need to be offset by productivity gains. And, we see, and as we see the impacts of sustained supply chain challenges, labour shortages, severe cost of doing business increases impacting our sector, improving productivity continues to be a critical need and an ongoing challenge. Improved productivity is a win-win outcome. Diverse workforces are more productive workforces. When our teams are more productive, it improves morale, elevates resources, and reduces the overall demands on our staff, staff particularly during a labour crisis. Workplaces with elevated productivity, be it through education, technology, or other investments, form a stronger workforce with more reliable career paths and more cause to pursue them. For our sector, productivity doesn't require big structural reform. It's simply a function of providing greater flexibility in part-time, secure work arrangements that allow businesses to commit to base hours and be able to flex up hours to meet consumer demand, whilst also providing employees with the option of more hours. Creating a safer, fairer and productive workplace should be in everyone's interest, employer, employees and unions. Finding a work placement for every Australian who wants a job, First Nations people, people living with a disability, older Australians and women, needs to be a priority for employees, employers, unions and government. We still have an amazing opportunity to find the 3.4 per cent of unemployed workers a job, and retail remains a great opportunity if we can all work together. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Next up is Joanne Schofield, who is the National President of the United Workers' Union. Thanks, Jamila, and uh, greetings, everyone. I want to start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people on whose lands we meet today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend those respects to all First Nations people who are here with us today. Uh, my union, United Workers Union, is one of the most uh, proudly diverse in the country. We represent workers in every part of the economy and from all walks of life. Far too many of them have been at the pointy end of problems in the industrial relations system over decades, such as wage stagnation, the collapse of enterprise bargaining, gender pay and other forms of inequality, and just plain exploitation. I want to echo the words of Michelle and Sally today about the importance of reform on gender equity and the need for reform on our bargaining system. Members of um, our union, like all workers everywhere, aspire to little more than a secure and safe job with pay that keeps up with the cost of living, opportunities to learn and grow while at work, opportunities to um, balance work with family commitments and other community commitments outside. But most importantly, they aspire to respect. Lack of respect came up as the second most significant issue of members of our union, 28,000 of them who undertook a voluntary survey um, last year, um, cited lack of respect as their second biggest concern at work. And these were members across the board, men, women, young, old, migrant, multi-generational Australians. Uh, people in care sector, paramedics, logistics, food production. It didn't matter if you drove a forklift or you educated a child. This was an outstanding issue and it was a staggering finding. And it's most curious because respect doesn't cost anything. It's free. When we talk to members about whether we should campaign in response to these findings, they tell us that. 
they, they say, why should we have to fight for this? It should be given to us for the work that we do. Drilling down into the responses, we saw that a lack of res respect played out in the day-to-day -day experience of members in many ways, through a lack of voice or consultation at work about changes, through bullying, harassment, racism, sexism, homophobia, where work was undervalued or low paid, and that was particularly strong amongst women and those working in aged care or when someone's contribution was overlooked and they didn't have opportunities to have a voice or a say in what was happening at work, both in a positive and a reactive way. I want to pause for a minute and ask you just to reflect on what this says about the health, productivity and safety of our workplaces. But more importantly, think about how this impacts on social cohesion, belonging and participation in our society. And there's no doubt that respect has been diminished by our industrial laws, which have been weak, too weak, in addressing discrimination. Our laws have been weak in tackling business models that rely on wage theft. Our laws can't prevent the creation of sham contracting or gig employment models that exist solely to drive wages down. And our laws, our laws can't uh, equalise the gender pay gap. Our weak laws collude with the visa system to result in some of the most egregious forms of servitude, forced labour, physical and sexual assault in sectors like agriculture and many more. And too often workers facing these experiences have absolutely nowhere to turn. Workers must have access to the right to join their union. They must have access to a truly independent and empowered Fair Work Commission who can be active in dispute resolution and in upholding rights. The Fair Work Commission should be given power to prevent discrimination and harassment in all forms, immediately picking up the recommendations of the Jenkin Report and strengthening rights of families to uh, work flexibly when it suits them. We need to make it quick and easy for workers to recover money and seek redress against unjust uh, treatment. And we need a visa amnesty for undocumented workers in agriculture and other sectors so those workers are safe, secure and visible in our economy. Laws are important, but equally so is the commitment to rebuild trust and respect in our workplaces. And in this, the role of delegates are key. And there are many, many reasons for this. Not, not, um, uh, first amongst these is that there are lower levels of workplace injuries and deaths in workplaces where there are stronger delegate structures. But um, to sum up some of the reasons put by a cleaner member of our union, Kerry, she says management will stand over people, especially those from non-English speaking backgrounds. Being a delegate is about standing up to bullying and harassment when members are put in a position that they are unsafe. It's about supporting people when they're asked to sign something that they don't know what they're signing or understand. And it's about speaking up when someone's allowance is not paid. Too often, when delegates speak up, they lose hours or worse. So my message today is pretty simple. Respectful workplaces are safe workplaces. They're workplaces with rights about consultation and change. They come with positive and protective measures to tackle discrimination in all its forms. Respect brings with it a voice for workers and a right to be represented by elected delegates who have support through paid training to do their job well. It comes with valuing the work of women and it comes with embracing concepts of productivity that go beyond economic models. And uh, if I had more time, I could tell you exactly what that means in the care sector, where workers are timed to, uh, through apps to provide care and, have no, and there's no emphasis on quality, on quality for the person receiving the care. So these issues um, uh, are absolutely important beyond the workplace or the economy. They're actually fundamental to a fair and inclusive society. Thank you. Joanne, thank you for those comments. Next is John Davies, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Constructors Association. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jamila. A healthy construction industry is the foundation of a strong economy. Our sector kept Australia moving during COVID, helped communities to recover from floods and bushfires, 
and is now leading our nation's economic recovery through a record $248 billion investment in infrastructure over the next four years. But this industry, Australia's third largest, which contributes 8% of GDP and employs one in 10 of the working population, is not in great shape. It operates on the slimmest of margins and accounts for 25% of all business insolvencies. It's so slow to change that only hunting and fishing have a worse track record when it comes to adoption of digital technologies. Great progress is being made in terms of improving the health and safety of our workforce, and for sure more needs to be done in that area. But we also need to address the other issues that are slowly killing our industry. Of critical importance is the need to improve the culture of our industry. It's simply not good enough. Women make up only 12% of our workforce, and that number dwindles to single digits when we're talking about trades. Disputes are commonplace, and our workers are six times more likely to die from suicide than they are from a workplace incident. Government, industry, and unions recognize the need for change and are taking important steps to achieve that. An example is the culture standard developed by the Construction Industry Culture Task Force. The culture standard is an important start to fixing our issues, but these issues are complex and interrelated, and arguably many of them are self-inflicted. We just love building stuff, stuff that you can touch and feel, stuff that you can show your kids and your grandkids. And we are also all too happy, unfortunately, to give our clients fixed prices for risks that simply cannot be quantified. You know, we're not um, a manufacturing industry. We don't make tins of beans. We're not a commodity. We're a highly skilled industry that solves complex problems every day. And we operate as a large network of businesses right across the economy, from small mum and dad contractors all the way up to large multinationals. And they deliver a $3 return on every dollar that's invested in infrastructure. There's a lot we should be proud of, but we could and should do so much more. If we could just half the gap in productivity growth between construction and other major industries, we could be saving $15 billion every single year. But more importantly, we could be improving the lives of our workers. Skilled migration and training are important, but they will not solve the capability and capacity issues that we have in the construction industry. The only way we can do that is to get more productive, to do more with the resources that we already have. To arrest the spiral of decline and become a safer, fairer, more productive industry, we need to change. We need to improve the culture of the industry. We need to improve our capability, capacity, and skills and we need to become more financially sustainable. But change will only happen if government, industry, and unions leave behind the baggage of history. We all need to work collaboratively like never before. And we need a disciplined client, a responsible client, a model client to lead us in the right direction. And that client is the government. Thank you, John, and thank you to our whole panel for those opening remarks. Again, while everyone is bringing their own perspectives, their own experience to the table today, I can see that there are emerging areas of common ground. Uh, they include the need for cultural change and policy change to ensure that all employees can bring their whole self to work and to be respected at work, as well as to do that work safely. I now want to invite our delegates to contribute to this conversation and ask a question of our panel or to make a comment themselves. Speakers, a reminder that we'd like you to keep your contributions to two minutes, otherwise you're standing between a lot of very hungry people and lunch. Our first speaker will be Michael Wright, Secretary of the Electrical Trades Union. Thank you. Uh, thank you kindly. And let me uh, commence by acknowledging the uh, traditional owners of the land that we meet on today and also echoing my respects. Now, Australia's future is bright, provided that we have the workforce to light it. And the construction industry is core to Australia's future. Whether it's building the Powering Australia plan, fixing our ageing infrastructure, 
or dealing with our housing crisis, we need a construction industry that we can depend upon. And yet this is a sector plagued with problems. Wage theft is rife, visa exploitation all too common, and work health and safety routinely, routinely compromised. Just this week, a University of Sydney report identified how squeezed margins on subcontractors are driving down apprentice opportunities. Subcontractors' margins are, are further squeezed by a lack of security of payments. Ours is an industry where workers and business owners suffer worse mental health outcomes due, in many instances, to truly unconscionable job design. And we have a gender divide that would have made the 1950s gasp. All too often, women don't even have equal bathrooms, let alone equal pay. Women in construction literally have nowhere to go. In the electrical trades, barely 2% of electrical tradespeople are women, and yet we've had a temporary shortage of electricians for over, over 20 years. If only we had an entire agenda that we, could have, that we could call on to help fill the gap. Now unions, business and government all know these problems are serious. We each deal with the consequences every day. Yet for too long, debate has focused on what drives us apart. Construction workers have been scapegoated and victim blamed. Their unions demonised and attacked by government. But the core challenges facing our industry cannot be fixed by short-term political attacks or anti-democratic task forces. Our core challenges require us to work together. An example of the goodwill that exists in our industry can be found with the government's Powering Australia agenda, an agenda that will revolutionise how and when we use, store and generate energy. From EVs and induction cooktops to smart buildings and a revamped electricity grid, all the way to offshore wind and battery storage, more than 600,000 jobs are forecast to be created in this sector alone. And to rise to this challenge, we have today launched our Powering Australia Jobs Plan, a plan we developed in partnership with the Clean Energy Council, Rewiring Australia, Smart Energy Council, Master Electricians, the National Electrical and Communications Association, and together we have a shared vision for how to tackle the truly incomprehensible volume of work which Powering, Powering Australia will require. It's a shared vision for how Australia's energy revolution must have a good jobs agenda at its core, because it's this good jobs agenda, particularly for our regions, which will deliver the social licence we need to harness the opportunities and end the decades-long climate war. Now, this is just one example of what we can achieve when we focus on what unites us instead of what divides. What we need is to now supercharge this goodwill. So, echoing the sentiments of John, and on behalf of Australia's construction unions, I propose that the government establish a national forum for the construction industry, bringing together employers, unions and government. This forum will be a vehicle for driving the cultural change we so desperately need, a vehicle for de to develop strategies to drive up the partic participation of those traditionally shut out, like women, culturally and li linguistically diverse, and First Nation workers, and a vehicle to innovate and disseminate the absolute best practices in work health and safety, including around mental health. It will be a vehicle to tone down the conflict in our, interest, in, our, in our industry and bring together all the good work which we already do. So I commend this proposal to the summit. The creation of a construction industry forum will be the important first brick in building the future that our workers, our businesses and our country needs. Michael, thank you for your comments and that proposal. The minister's writing things furiously. Uh, we're up to David Pocock, senator for the ACT. Thank you. It's on. Yep. Uh, data shows that construction is one of the most dangerous industries to work in. According to Safe Work Australia, it has the third highest fatality rate of any sector. And as John mentioned earlier, mental health is also a major challenge. A construction worker has lost a suicide every second day in Australia. <laughs> it's obviously a male-dominated uh, workforce, um, and you know, it's a bunch of men talking about construction here, so that's probably something to think about. Uh, a meagre 3% of trade roles are filled by women. And at the same time, it is one of Australia's biggest industries and a major driver of our economy. I think that everyone here would agree that improving safety and maintaining productivity is vital. It's a lot of what I'm hearing today. And while the government took a clear policy to the election of abolishing one of our existing regulators, the ABCC, 
Many concerns have been raised with me about what comes next. What resources will the Fair Work Ombudsman have to pick up their workload? What's the government's plan to address safety and productivity on work sites? And fundamentally, how do we stop this issue from being the highly ideological political football it has been for more than a decade? It would be great to get an agreement on a tripartisan solution like John has suggested. Uh, it raises the question of who might spearhead this. Kate Jenkins is, is here today. Uh, Kate, given the hugely important work you've led in the space, is this something that you'd consider? Uh, could there be an opportunity for you to work with industry, unions, and regulators to improve conditions and outcomes for workers in this industry? Thank you, Senator Pocock. And uh, look, Kate Jenkins has got a lot of time on her hands, so we shall go to her next. Working? Yes. I think it's sort of pretty well known that I like a challenge. So um, it, it is a very tempting, I think, for people around me, perhaps I shouldn't be tempted, but um, I know from experience um, making change in really important sectors has a much bigger impact than making change in just one business or one organisation. Uh, so I am open to uh, seeing how I could assist. The Human Rights Commission has such unique functions and powers. We know taking industry action, one of the outcomes of the Respect at Work inquiry was uh, that the best progress we're making is by industry action. And we know, and it's known, that uh, the industry of parliament, of mining, of sport, of retail are all turning their minds collectively to this. And the idea of bringing together all the players um, to make change and to address the issues which are joint, which is the spirit of this summit, and also the spirit of the Respect at Work Council that I chair. It's a very, um, it's a very positive and constructive suggestion. And having heard unions and employers both saying that times for change, I think everyone here knows the community over the last few years has been demanding change on safety and respect in workplaces. And I, I think we've seen a building evolution. I feel like this summit is another turning point. Um, I will confess that the conversations today and leading up to this have, have just given me the chills um, with such hope and optimism of change. We're not having to argue um, why we need more women in the workplace. Um, I love Michael saying, imagine if we had a whole gender we could pull on. Uh, but I am absolutely in this sector aware that there are not the women and the women who are there are facing much higher risks of of sexual harassment, abuse, bullying, and we need to change that. Um, so I'll look forward to what that will look like. Um, I know the collective action is there and also just um, say thank you both for the government to ex for accepting all the respect at work recommendations. The positive duty is on the way. Construction can lead the way in showing how that works. And also just say thank you for welcoming myself, June Oscar and Ben Gortlett, all from the Human Rights Commission. Uh, we're a small organisation, but um, so much of the discussion about employment is about everyone's multiple of human rights. Uh, so getting employment right for a whole, our whole community will make a very big difference. Thanks. Thanks, Jim Jamila. Uh, thank you so much, Kate, and thank you earlier to Senator Pocock. Uh, next, we'll hear from Zoe Daniel, MP, who's the member for Goldstein. Thank you, Jamila, and nice to see you there too. Uh, my respects to First Nations people, both in the room and elsewhere. I'll start by saying, as one of the last speakers of the morning, that this should not be ruled off as the pink section of the summit. Empowering women is a cross-cutting priority as we've heard today. And all new legislation should include a gender impact statement because women are done with being secondary. I propose the following. One, the government's childcare measures must be brought forward. If we can afford stage three tax cuts, we can afford this economy boosting measure. Two, childcare must cater for all women. Many can't access childcare due to irregular short shifts. And these women have no agency to change that. As part of the forthcoming white paper, I propose roster justice. 
that government, business and unions reach agreement to ensure that major employers upgrade rostering so that part-time and casual workers know their hours with reasonable notice. No woman should be left behind. I suggest the following amendments to the Fair Work Act. Strengthen an employee's capacity to request flexible working arrangements. Currently, a request can be made, but there's no appeal mechanism. Sandwich generation women are caring for children and elderly parents. Flexibility is key. And immediately improve unpaid parental leave provisions in the Act to make them more flexible and more shareable. More broadly, we need 26 weeks of shareable paid parental leave. Funding of apprenticeships must include women and feminised industries like fashion. Women deserve a fair share of apprenticeships. And finally, that the white paper include gender pay gap reporting for employers. Transparency requirements on the pay gap, women in leadership and flexibility are appropriate and have succeeded overseas. This is a no-cost measure that can be led by the public service. And I ask that this be considered by the new Women's Economic Equality Task Force. Enough of paying lip service to equality and safety for women. Today, as Kate said, provides optimism. Women want to work. We simply must enable them. Thank you. Zoe, thank you for your words. Next, we'll go to Dylan Alcott, 2022 Australian of the Year. Uh, G'day, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having me here today. I'm wearing a green suit with a light green top, uh, and I'm sitting in a black wheelchair for all my low vision and blind friends. I want to thank the Treasurer and the Prime Minister and everybody for having me here today as a washed-up tennis player. Uh, I feel very lucky. I'd much rather be here than the US Open. Don't worry about that. Um, and I also want to thank you know, the thousands of people with disability that could be sitting in this chair right now, talking to you right now. The people that came before me, I feel very grateful. I really do, and I can hope I can do it justice. I've counted, I've heard the word disability 33 times today. That didn't happen in the past. That's great. It really is great. I've also heard about the massive opportunity because of the low unemployment rate and the staff shortages that are currently going on. That's great as well. But we've had this opportunity before, and we've dropped the ball. Uh, there are 4.5 million people Nearly 4.5 million people in this country, some form, some form of physical or non-physical disability, visible or invisible, and only 54% of them are involved in the workforce. Uh, I'm 31 years old. That participation rate hasn't changed in 28 years. My whole life, it hasn't changed. And to be honest, that's not fair. That really isn't fair, because people with a disability are ready to have the choice if they want to work just like anybody else. Also, for people in the room, the big corporates, government, you know, there are people with disability working within your workplaces. That's a great start. But a lot of them are on the supported wage scheme, which means you aren't paying their wage. Maybe someone else is, the government. Um, even though they're doing their role, just as good as anybody else, contributing to your organisations. And in a time of a pandemic or a natural disaster or a recession, whose jobs go first? People with disabilities jobs. And that's not fair. And it's not just about getting us in the front door, it's about creating a safe workplace once we are there. Safe from discrimination, safe from unconscious bias, from abuse, from neglect. We all need to work together, both government and corporate, to make sure our workplaces are safe for people with disability. And one of the best ways to do that is to listen to the lived experience of people with disability. But also not just build capacity in us, Build capacity in all your teams so everybody, not just people with disability, can go to work and be their authentic self and thrive. And the reason to do this is not just to do the right thing, which is true, it's just bloody good business as well. Because people with disability are 90% more likely to be equal to or more productive than able-bodied people. We have higher retention rates, lower absenteeism, 61% incre increase in workplace morale when people with disability are hired. 41, 49% increase in skill gaps, yet the unemployment rate of people with disability is more than double, almost triple that of able-bodied people. And you know what? The time to change that isn't now, it was yesterday, if I'm honest with you. But it is really awesome to be able to come here and talk about it because we all need to work together. Government, corporate, unions, everybody in our sector needs to come together and make this happen. 
um, because, to be honest, there are so many people with disability out there ready to have a crack. And some people want a job, for sure. But do you know what else some people want? They want a career. They want a leadership position. I don't want to scare you, but we want your seats as well. <laughs> and I think we deserve the opportunity to be able to thrive that and make our economy better as a result of that. And look, you can hear my voice. I love this. Uh, it's the reason I get out of bed every single day. I'm here all week. Um, my consulting firm, GSA, are here. Our new jobs platform, The Field. We're all going to be here. Ben Gauntlet, there are some other representatives in the room. But don't just talk to us. Talk to everybody watching on this stream as well, out there. Because the time to do it is now. And um, let's, in my case, metaphorically, kick some ass together. Thank you. Dylan, thank you for that contribution, for being the washed-up tennis player in the room. Always nice to have one. Uh, and uh, as a fellow person with a disability, I really appreciate those comments. Thank you. Uh, we are now turning to John Azarius, who's a public policy expert. Hello, uh, Jamila. Thank you very much. Um, my comments will be, my two minutes will be uh, split in two parts. First, I'll talk about a review that, we, that I had the privilege of chairing last year. Uh, on agricultural workforce issues, and uh, there will be some issues that we identified in uh, the way uh, people are treated in agriculture. But then the second part will be about an example of cooperation amongst states, employers, unions, where um, there is a way forward. So our 11 member panel from varied backgrounds uh, unanimously found that there are indeed issues of exploitation and some of the unanimous recommendations that we made were um, labor hire companies are a good thing, they provide flexibility in the workforce, but uh, they need to be uh, regulated. And uh, we, uh, not registered, but regulated, and we thought that the best way of regulating labor hire companies is by enacting mirror legislations, taking the Queensland Act, which is a, a, a very good act and has been in place for some time, and for the other states and territories to do mirror le uh, legislations uh, based on that. A little bit a la uh, WHS, uh, which in this country is uh, the envy of the OECD. The second uh, 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 recommendation was that the ATO's single-touch payroll provisions should also apply to labor hire companies. And the third one, again to do with the ATO, is that it should become mandatory for visa applicants uh, when, uh, that have uh, working rights attached to their visas to apply for a tax file number before their visas are issued. This should be a condition precedent. And uh, 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 this was, uh, the same recommendation was made in the review, uh, the robust new foundations review in 2014. And uh, it uh, makes us all have tax file numbers, whether we are permanent residents or temporary residents, and uh, it gives uh, protection to vulnerable people. Now, to move to the second part, which is what we also found is that in our regions, the magnificent drive and leadership and innovation that comes from our regions, especially from uh, women in our regions. And uh, there are many initiatives on training that come up from, uh, from the regions. And I want to cite one example where there is, as I said earlier, this uh, um, cooperation that our Prime Minister wants to see coming out of this, uh, um, out of this summit. And it's a program that uh, was started originally by a Labour Federal Minister, uh, Joe Lutwick from Queensland again, and which has been taken to uh, great heights by a coalition government in New South Wales. And it's called AgSkilled where there is uh, a steering committee, and it has been in existence now for seven years, there is a steering committee made up of employer representatives, people from 
cotton Australia, the grain growers, now the horticulturalists and uh, uh, um, uh, rice uh, growers. And this uh, steering committee uh, defines what micro-credentials are needed. And because there is a budget that is quarantined over three years, uh, the RTOs uh, can uh, 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 plan and have the micro-credentials. The uh, completion rates on these courses are over 90%. So this is a perfect example of something that where you have federal government, state government, public officials, employers, and uh, now employees working together, and it can be moved from outside agriculture into uh, other areas, into uh, uh, manufacturing, into the care sector. It is a tried and proved uh, uh, program, and I commend that program to the summit. Thank you, Jamila. Thank you so much, John, and a sincere thank you to our panel and also to all of the speakers from the floor. We appreciate you sharing not only your ideas and expertise, but your personal experiences as well. I'm now going to hand over to Minister Burke to speak about opportunities and areas for future work and to close the session. Okay, thank you, Jamila. Uh, I'll try to bring two hours of conversation together. Uh, can I just start by saying we've just had two hours that I think would have been impossible six months ago. Uh, and people have come with answering the request from the Prime Minister in terms of instead of going into our corners of seeing where we might be able to reach agreement and what's just been achieved in the last two hours. Uh, couldn't have happened six months ago, and I'll tell you two weeks ago, I wasn't as optimistic that we might actually get to the spot that we've got to, so I want to thank everybody involved for that. I think it's been extraordinary. I'll go, first of all, through some issues uh, that were raised that I want to be able to follow up on, and they will be areas that we'll have to do further work on, and then I'll follow up with areas where I think we'll be ready to take immediate action based on what's been said today. Uh, first of all, on areas for further work, uh, there's been calls for additional funding to help employer representatives and union representatives improve safety, fairness and productivity in, the work, in workplaces. I want us to, to work through what we can do there and, and keep that work going. Uh, amend relevant legislation to give workers the right to challenge unfair contractual terms. That's something that will require quite a bit of consultation on that. So, but we're up for the work, to initiate a detailed consultation and research process, considering the impact of workplace relations settings. Now, some of these go quite, quite specifically to the issues about work and care, including childcare. Allowing the Fair Work Commission to set minimum standards uh, to ensure the road transport industry is safe, sustainable and viable to ensure that workers have access to representation to address genuine safety and compliance issues at work, uh, and also to consider a further issue that was raised with respect to additional funding on the Fair Work Commission building cooperative workplace relations, late relationships. Uh, the issue was raised about a, a living wage. That's a lot of work on developing something like that, but let's start that process. Uh, and finally, there have been a few different points that have been made about the, interaction, about the operation of the award system. Uh, so let's start the work on possible improvements to modern awards and the national employment standards. But I then go to the issues where I think we're ready for immediate action. Uh, first of all, in terms of what we are all doing, and I think the conversation that we've just had says we are ready uh, for business, for unions and for government to start to work out where are the additional places where we can strengthen tripartism and constructive social dialogue in workplace relations. Let's start to find every mechanism where the three come together. We work proactively to revitalise a culture of creativity, productivity, good faith negotiation and genuine agreement in Australian workplaces. There was a very specific moment that we've had with respect to the construction industry 
and I don't want to let that moment pass. We, John Davies, Michael Wright, David Pocock, Kate Jenkins all spoke to it. Uh, so let's start the work now and let's, let's decide that we are going to establish a tripartite national construction industry forum to constructively address issues such as mental health, safety, training, apprentices, productivity, culture, diversity and gender equity in that industry. We then go to issues that have been raised on, on the Fair Work Act itself. Uh, now, none of us are here with direct amendments to the Act, but we're here with some pretty clear principles that have been raised and I want to go through the amendments where I think we're ready for action and then I'll go through very briefly in terms of the timing of consultation to make sure that those who are direct stakeholders in that know that they've got a seat at the table as we have the consultation first on principles before the department would go to a situation of drafting. Uh, first of all, uh, providing stronger access to flexible working arrangements and unpaid parental leave so modern families can share work and caring responsibilities. Next, to provide stronger protections for workers against adverse action, all forms of discrimination and harassment. These are all changes to the Fair Work Act. Next, ensuring all workers and businesses can negotiate in good faith for agreements that benefit them, including small business, women, care and community services sectors, and First Nations people. Next, ensuring workers and businesses have flexible options for reaching agreements, including removing unnecessary limitations on access to single and multi-employer agreements, allowing businesses and workers who already successfully negotiate enterprise level agreements to be able to do so without those changes interfering with it. Removing unnecessary complexity for workers and employers, including making the better off overall test simple, flexible and fair. Giving the Fair Work Commission the capacity to proactively help workers and businesses reach agreements that benefit them particularly new entrants and small and medium businesses, providing proper support for employer bargaining representatives and union delegates, and ensuring the process for agreement terminations is fit for purpose, fair, and sunsets the so-called zombie agreements. In terms of the meetings with uh, my department, the secretary of my department is here somewhere, so I'm going to unilaterally just let you know this is a consultation process. I know we've had a big lead up to this week. Consultation with my department for the different stakeholders in turning these principles into law and working through the detail of the principles will begin next week. We've been building up to today. We're not going to waste time. People have asked to make sure that they're at the table. That consultation will continue in good faith, but we're not going to delay on those issues, we start next week. Thank you again to, to Minister Burke for those comments. I see a lot of happy faces in the crowd. And back to Helen. Uh, yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Um, that was a, a massive couple of hours. Um, thank you. It is now officially lunchtime. Uh, lunch is available at the back of the room. If you'd like to get some fresh air, which seems like a very good idea at this uh, stage of proceedings, you're welcome to grab your lunch and walk through the centre door here, which I'm told will open magically in a minute. Um, and if you're also concerned uh, or interested to know what the dinner seating plan will look like. That will be available this evening ahead of dinner. Um, so you'll have to just hang out for that one. Uh, thank you all and we'll see you back here at 1.35 uh, on time, hopefully. Thank you. Hello and welcome back, uh, everybody, to this afternoon's session. 
Uh, despite my bossiness last time, um, we actually did sort of make it um, bossiness towards a certain uh, couple of people. Um, we did actually make it on time in the last session, so I'm, I'm adamant that I'm going to continue my excellent record. This session features an introductory video from the Honourable Chris Bowen, MP, uh, Minister for Climate Change and Energy. The session is called Workforce Opportunities for Clean Energy and Tackling Climate Change. The session will be facilitated by Assistant Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Jenny McAllister, with a presentation by Kane Thornton, the Chief Executive of Clean Energy Council. And so I will now hand it over to Minister Bowen. I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but you are in the very capable hands of my colleagues, including my Assistant Minister, Jenny McAllister. Well, at the election, I said that the world's climate emergency is Australia's jobs opportunity, and now we want to work with you to make that a reality. If we are going to be successful in setting Australia up to take advantage of our opportunities and become a renewable energy superpower, then it needs to be not a whole of government effort, not a whole of government's effort, but a whole of society effort. Because we need to work fast to make up the wasted time making our energy sector fit for the future and restoring Australia's climate credentials. But we need to work even faster to get in place the workers to drive this transformation. The stakes are very high. We aren't just talking about driving down power bills and delivering a cleaner future for our children, as important as that is. We're also talking about an economic transformation. This is a remarkable economic opportunity for our country, but also a challenge. When I think about the potential obstacles on our journey to becoming a renewable energy powerhouse, skill shortages and supply chain constraints are high on my list. But if we get it right, the dividend is large for our country. Our Powering Australia policy will deliver 82% renewable energy by 2030, supercharging $76 billion of investment and creating more than 604,000 jobs, five out of six of them in Australia's regions. To achieve our goals, we need more workers at every stage of our renewables revolution. Upskilling current workers, attracting new workers, training the next generation. Last week, Jenny and I hosted and focused a climate change and energy job summit with stakeholders and experts in the sector. We focused on three key themes that emerged. Firstly, clear signals from government are required to maximise the climate and energy job opportunities. Secondly, the energy transformation requires a step change in planning and coordination. And thirdly, a place-based approach will help address the unique needs across the regions. I hope that the outcomes of our mini-summit help inform this summit today. I'm very proud that one of the first acts of the government was the passage of the Climate Change Bill through the House of Representatives and I'm hopeful of the Senate in the next two sitting weeks. But make no mistake, passage of this legislation isn't job done. It's just the beginning. Transforming our energy network and achieving our climate goals, as well as ensuring we have the people and skills to do this, is work that we have to get on with. In the Albanese government, we have passion, energy and ideas, but we don't have all the ideas and we certainly don't have all the wisdom. So I'm grateful for your time today, but I'm even more grateful for your thoughts, experiences and ideas. Over to you. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing the outcomes of the summit today. Well, thanks everybody for being here this afternoon. My name is Jenny McAllister, and like others before me, I acknowledge that today we meet on the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Uh, I like to think that we've saved the best till last. Uh, I'm very conscious that it's the last session of the afternoon, but we have a terrific lineup this afternoon to talk about an issue that, as Minister Bowen says, is very, very important and represents a very significant opportunity for our country. It means a lot to have so many of you engaged, not just engaged today, but also in the weeks that have led up to this event. At a personal level, I am very grateful for the frank advice, the discussion and the generous information sharing from so many of the people in this room and in the clean energy sector and the energy sector more broadly in the first 100 days of this government. As Minister Bowen said, our climate change bill is an important step 
in providing a clear signal to business and to the world that Australia will engage with the reality of a warming world. But the hardest work lies ahead. We are now entering a new phase where we move on from discussion about whether we will join the global transition and instead discuss how. And that is what today is all about. There were so many good ideas at the Focused Climate and Energy Job Summit that Minister Bowen and I hosted last week. But more than that, in that room, like the room today, there was the spirit of cooperation and collaboration that we will need to enact them. We have a great panel here today to continue that discussion. Uh, we have Sarah McNamara, the Chief Executive of the Australian Energy Council. We have Kelly O'Shaughnessy, the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Conservation Foundation. We have John Grimes, the Chief Executive from the Smart Energy Council. And we have Steve Murphy, the National Secretary of the Australian Manufacturing Workers' Union. Uh, to kick us off, though, we are going to hear a presentation from Kane Thornton. Uh, Kane, of course, is from the Clean Energy Council. They have released a very helpful piece of research and a publication this week, uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing your contribution. Kane, welcome. Thanks very much, uh, Assistant Minister. Uh, can I also uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're meeting here today and pay my respects to elders past, present and future? Uh, I grew up uh, near Balan uh, in central Victoria. It's a small, uh, fairly unremarkable uh, town established in the 1830s on Wuthering land along the route from Melbourne to the Victorian goldfields. As the gold rush subsided, sheep farming became the backbone of the district. But the last five years have changed the face of Balan and dozens of similar country towns across Australia for they have become hubs for a flourishing new industry. Balan is now at the forefront of the global clean energy revolution. A bunch of wind farms in the region have created a wave of new jobs and given the community hope for a strong and vibrant future. The Australian clean energy sector is now preparing for a period of extraordinary growth and development as we accelerate to a fully clean power system here in Australia. Australia is now on the path to become a global clean energy superpower. The amount of clean energy we need and indeed can deploy over the coming decade is truly eye-watering. Let's look at a few of the numbers. The latest integrated system plan from the market operator outlines the case for an eight-fold increase an eight-fold increase over the next couple of decades in the level of clean energy in this country. The numbers are truly extraordinary. 140 gigawatts of large-scale wind and solar capacity, over 60 gigawatts of storage and hydro capacity, and 69 gigawatts of small-scale solar and household batteries, all of this by 2050. Add to this the rollout of some 10,000 kilometres of transmission lines to build a more modern, resilient 21st century electricity grid. With this sort of scale, we need to create stronger, more resilient and ethical local supply chains, manufacturing more of our key clean energy components right here in Australia. Electrifying Australian homes and businesses will be critical to reduce our exposure to high-cost gas and our increasingly ageing and unreliable coal-fired generation. And doing so can create tens of thousands of new jobs amongst electricians, plumbers, solar and battery installers and their trade assistants. Add to that the extraordinary export opportunity and the scale of change that can bring to Australia. In Queensland alone, a vibrant green hydrogen industry exporting renewable electricity to the world could require more than 26,000 construction jobs by 2050. The flow on economic and employment benefits to regions reliant on low-cost energy for their global competitiveness is difficult to comprehend, not to mention the opportunity for Australia's critical minerals that can power the global clean energy revolution. 
Delivering this transformation will require an enormous number of workers with the right skills in the right locations. According to Reputext, modelling based on the government's Powering Australia policy, there could be over 600,000 additional direct and indirect jobs created by 2030. This presents an enormous opportunity and at a time when even the current demand for clean energy workers is going unmet. Over the past five years, we've doubled the amount of renewable energy in Australia, from 15 per cent now to 30 per cent. This created a strong industry and workforce of over 30,000 people employed directly in the clean energy sector. But it also exposed immediate gaps in the workforce, from electricians and trade assistants to battery design specialists, wind turbine technicians, electrical engineers, drivers, roofers and solar farm operators. These gaps are only going to widen unless we take action now. Some of the solutions are very obvious. The clean energy sector has been a political football kicked about as part of the climate wars and a wasted decade. Nothing undermined confidence of investors more than unpredictable, unhelpful and unstable climate and energy policy. Why would a business expand its manufacturing facility, bring on apprentices or reskill its workforce if they thought the government was just going to pull the rug out from under them? And here I want to acknowledge the leadership, particularly of our states and territories over the past 10 years, stepping up, providing certainty, providing direction for an industry when it was most required. And to the Albanese government, thank you for your leadership. In just a hundred odd days, you've taken some swift and significant steps in restoring confidence in clean energy in Australia. And that will have a material impact on the confidence of the thousand businesses that I represent to now invest in the workers they need over coming decades. Thank you. There are key parts of the Australian community that aren't fully represented and participating in the clean energy workforce today. While First Nations people make up over 3% of the population, they comprise just 0.8% of the current clean energy workforce. There are many opportunities for First Nations people to participate and benefit from, clean, from the clean energy revolution, and that must include the opportunity for a clean energy job supporting them with the right training, pay and conditions to keep them on the land and contributing to their local community. Much has already been said today about the challenges and the opportunity to improve female participation in the workforce. And many of these challenges and opportunities and recommendations resonate and apply equally to the clean energy sector. Female representation in the sector is currently at 39%, a long way ahead of oil and gas at 23 and coal at 16. But we see the same trends at play. Women are overrepresented in administrative roles, more than 60%, and underrepresented in the trades, in senior management at 32%, and boards at just 19%. I think many of the recommendations put forward this morning are critically important to our sector and we encourage progress on those as quickly as possible. Our Women in Renewables program is also playing an important role, helping to evolve workplaces and develop and support the next generation of female leaders. Over 70 per cent of the current energy workforce is in rural and regional Australia. As I said, clean energy has changed the face of country towns like the land, and it can create hundreds of regional hubs just like it right across Australia. The outcomes of this summit are critical for the clean energy sector. If we get it right, we create hundreds of thousands of high quality, sustainable clean energy jobs, and we deliver Australia as a clean energy superpower. So let me briefly touch on the seven critical steps to doing that. Firstly, we need all sorts of leadership and common sense on climate and energy policy. We need clear targets, we need stable policy, we need strong leadership and we need collaboration. Secondly, active coordination of the massive project pipeline on its way. 
We need to sequence the build out of renewable energy generation, of transmission, and we need to coordinate that with the massive infrastructure projects occurring right around the country. Thirdly, we need to better understand and anticipate future workforce needs with detailed analysis and forecasting of our future requirements. Fourthly, we need to establish transition authorities to support those regional communities and take a strategic approach to reskilling and developing new industries in the right regions. We need to calibra calibrate our higher education and reform the VET sector's capacity to understand and meet the needs of industry. Six, we need to reform our immigration system to attract skilled workers and talented students and establish Australia as a hub of clean energy expertise. And finally, we need to raise the profile and career paths to attract young people into the right clean energy career. This all requires collaboration between governments at all levels, between community, development bodies, unions, the education sector, and of course the clean energy industry. We do not have time to waste. Opportunity like this comes knocking but once in a generation. This is our generation's opportunity to deliver a clean energy future for Australia, to set us up to become a global clean energy superpower and create an extraordinary legacy for Australian workers. Thank you. Kane, thank you so much. And the Clean Energy Council has done so much work over such a long period of time, bringing credible information into the public debate about clean energy and the possibilities. And we're so grateful for your presence here today and for all of that work. Um, but you have set a number of challenges for our panel. And I'm going to direct my first question um, to John Grimes. Um, the speech you heard just now points to very large opportunities, um, very large numbers of jobs, but we know that there are already skill gaps um, emerging in many different occupations within the sector. Um, I know that your members would tell you the same story. What are the things we need to do to accelerate the development of skills that we need for this transition? Minister, thank you, and, and I too would just like to start by acknowledging and paying my respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people uh, and any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us here today. Um, Minister, I think it's really interesting. Our sector actually sits at the intersection point of three megatrends that the CSIRO talked about before. Uh, adapting to climate, cleaner, greener, leaner, and the geopolitical shift. You know, it's only a sh couple of short weeks ago that the spike in the gas price internationally almost, almost shut our economy down. Right? Uh, and we're seeing lots of uh, pressures in the supply chains as well. Um, I, I think it's worth just, just noting that this transition that Kane has outlined that is, that is coming is actually going to be as big and as significant as the Industrial Revolution. But it's going to happen 10 times quicker than the Industrial Revolution did. Over the next decade, everything changes, and there is no part of the economy that's not, not, not touched by this fundamental shift to a low-carbon future. So it's, it's renewables, it's the electrification of taking the petrol and the diesel load in electric vehicles and turning it into electricity. It's actually heat pumps. Uh, it's super efficient energy uh, electricity appliances. About 100 million machines are going to be installed over the next decade, and that is an enormous challenge uh, and, and a big extra load onto our electricity sector. But it's more than that. It actually means that Australia is sitting on the cusp of the cheapest and cleanest electricity in history. Now, that has profound implications for our economy. It means that we can attract the, the energy intensive industries from around the world to actually set up base here in Australia because their, their competitive advantage is the world's cheapest and cleanest electricity. Um, <clears throat> it means that we will be able to reindustrialize the Australian economy. It's about, it's about powering the, the manufacturing agenda. It's about process adding and value adding to steel, to aluminium, to other minerals, instead of digging up dirt, putting it on a, on a ship and sending it overseas. 
Uh, and so uh, it's going to touch every business. We heard uh, Anthony Pratt from Visi talking about in their business that the need to capture those methane emissions and actually do something with that, right? It's actually across the whole economy. So the required skills actually stretch from everything from boiler makers to IT software engineers and literally everything in between because this is a whole of economy uh, approach. And I would say that actually this is a race. Australia is competing with other places in the world that have great sun and wind, like the Middle East, like the deserts of the United States of America, like, like Chile, right? And so if we don't get our skates on, we won't capture a disproportionate share of that value for our economy. That's why this is so important. Now, if you had a plan to transition the economy from a skills perspective, you wouldn't start from here, right? You can't even get a solar sparky on your roof, right? Um, and as the Prime Minister said this morning, we have an electricity grid past its use-by date. So there is a lot of work to be done. But if we pull it off, actually the opportunities are immense. I returned on Tuesday from India, where I was talking to the Indian government and major Indian industry about the opportunities. Now, India is set to become the largest market of lithium-ion batteries in the world. A lot of their, their transport is two-wheelers and three-wheelers. Last month in India, there were more electric vehicle three-wheelers sold than petrol-driven or diesel-driven uh, three-wheelers, right? This is a bottom-up transformation that's happening in the transportation system in places like India. So um, uh, Australia, of course, we heard, has all of the minerals required to make those lithium-ion batteries right here. Right? Don't send the lithium ore overseas, capture it and value-add. And that's what they're doing in New South Wales today, in Tomago. And it's what the West Australian government has a strategic plan to do. I think we need to start thinking and acting as Team Australia. How do we collectively capture more value for, for, our, for our economy here? But we have to make it real. And that's why we're, we're pleased to have partnered with the Electrical Trades Union, with the Master Electricians and with other partners to call for a Powering Australia Skills Cluster to be set up across the country and an apprentice support network. So let me conclude, Minister, just by saying three things. I think at the top of the list is let's engage women in our industry. To hear from the ETU that 2 per cent of Sparkies are female isn't good enough. We need to make those jobs real for women right across our economy. I'd like to particularly uh, give a shout out to a, a great organisation, the Australian Women in Solar Energy Organisation, Sam Craft and the leadership there, and they're doing that. They're telling the personal stories about how you can go from being a town planner to being in this sector, how you can go from communications and, and community engagement to being in this sector, making it real, really important. Second, Minister, I would say let's tap our regions. I don't think we've talked enough today about regional and rural Australia. How do we take Scott Farquhar's Atlassian example, right, of workers working anywhere and turn it into uh, a trainers and people seeking skills anywhere and actually deliver it to every Australian wherever they are in Australia. And the, and the, third, uh, the third would be, once we've done that, Let's attract and recruit the best brains in this industry to Australia, right? Let's actually increase the size and capacity of Team Australia, and let's go do it. Thank you, John. And that emphasis again on collaboration. Kelly O'Shaughnessy, I want to ask you about the opportunity, because it's not exclusively concentrated in the energy sector, is it? And I know that your, your organisation thinks a lot about the broadest opportunities associated with the transition. What do you think we should be preparing for and what do we need to do to get ready? Uh, well, it's a real honour to be here on Ngunnawal country um, and I pay my respects, but actually also I wanted to say, isn't it amazing that we're here talking about climate action in a positive way, that it is good for our country, good for jobs, good for economy. We've been banging on that for a while at the ACF. Um, and I, there's a lot being said about the opportunities, the jobs, what that looks like, the industries. I won't repeat any of that. Um, there's two points, I think, that we haven't heard yet today. The first is that 
Australia really matters when it comes to climate change because what we're exporting to the world is helping to fuel climate change and what we could export to the world will help solve climate change. So clean exports is really the main game actually when we're talking about jobs associated with climate change and the renewable future. The, net, uh, the Melbourne University, Princeton University, NAUS, Queensland Uni have just done a study on how to get Australia to net zero emissions and our exports to net zero emissions. And they say there's 1.3 million jobs up. One million of those is in exports. So we need to uh, get on with that as quickly as we can. The second big area that we haven't talked about, of course, is nature. And you can't get to a net zero Australia without getting to a nature positive Australia. And there are enormous amounts of jobs in regenerating nature, which provides uh, services for our food, bees that pollinate our crops, water, regulates our climate. Um, and jobs in regenerating nature can be on farms, on traditional lands, in cities. Um, and we really need to get on with that because nature is in trouble in Australia. We've just found our State of the Environment report says half of the world's mammals that have gone extinct in the last 200 years have gone extinct in Australia. So we have problems, but that is a great opportunity. And my suggestion there is we do quite a bit of work on the nature related jobs. It's nowhere near as advanced as the climate related jobs. So there are three things I think that we need to do to harness those opportunities. The first is that we need to plan because the, the transition has to be really fast and fair. And we just need to know what type of country we want to be, what type of industries we want to have, where we want those industrial precincts, where we want renewable energy zones to be. Uh, and we do need to have that transition authority at the national level, but also at the regional levels to guide that transition. Um, the second is investment to accelerate the clean energy future. Uh, it's not yet here, but it's very, very close. And a report by BCA, ACT, UACF and WODEF asked for $10 billion of co-investment to bring that clean energy future here faster. Uh, that's a lot of money, but we spend $12.5 billion a year on fossil fuel subsidies, and I think it's time that we start investing in clean in this country and move those subsidies to clean. Uh, the last thing I would say is um, we need to go fast, and there's two reasons. Economic, 65% of our trading partners have a net zero emissions mid-century target. Eight and ten exports are at risk in Australia. That's $250 billion because they are high in emissions. So there's a good economic reason, but there's also a save all living things on the planet reason why we need to act quickly. Australia's emissions increased last year. That was before the new government was elected, so it's our collective challenge. Parts per million of CO2 is 419 and counting. Um, there are no jobs on a dead planet, but there are absolutely millions of jobs on a net zero emissions planet and a nature positive planet. Start again. Sarah, we have to take communities with us. Um, you represent some of our largest energy companies and many of them have sites in regional areas that have either been repurposed, retooled, sometimes closed, sometimes preparing for one or the other of those things. What have we learnt so far about that experience in community? What do you see as good practice and how can we reinforce and support that? Thank you, Minister. Well, the energy transformation is well underway in this country, um, but we have had a really difficult decade. And I don't think the uh, clarity that is afforded by this government's clear policy frameworks can be understated when it comes to investor confidence in delivering on this energy market transition. So that's a really positive thing. And I really um, applaud the words of my colleagues here about the skills challenge ahead of us for the clean energy transformation. There's no question we need to get lots more skilled people, particularly in those important fields like engineering and the electrical trades involved in our industry, because there's heaps of really exciting opportunities. But that said, there's another workforce that we're really concerned about and looking after uh, in my sector, and my members include uh, the owners and operators of all the coal generation plants across the country. 
And that's the workforces that are working at those coal plants, knowing that those plants are starting to come to the end of their operational lives. Now, we're kind of in a unique position uh, in the energy sector, in coal, because we have a fair idea when these plants are going to close. And some workers in other sectors of the economy aren't afforded um, that opportunity. But what that runway, if you like, uh, gives our members is an opportunity to plan and to work with their workforces and their communities uh, to work out how they can support workers uh, into the next stage of their careers. And of course, some of those workers will be towards the end of their careers and perhaps choosing to take a redundancy. Others want to reskill and move into other sectors, usually in the same regional community, because of course a coal plant is usually the dominant employer uh, in a regional area. Uh, and others may be able to actually work on site as well in a repurposed way, either through a remediation process or perhaps there's a clean energy uh, project that's going to be planned for that site. But much of this work has been happening over the last decade. And we have seen some really good examples of what we think is pretty good practice when it comes to helping these communities transition away from coal-fired power stations. And they do have um, some common threads. Um, firstly, it is a really engaged employer who is very close to their workforce and interested in listening to their employees and their needs. Uh, there is usually a strong local community alliance, often that is set up with government backing as well, that works with the broader community and, uh, and the owner of the plant and the workforce to think about broader opportunities through the community, both for people in those workforces, but also for those who've had a secondary benefit from the operation of the plant and the economic benefits it brings to the region. So there's often, in an imaginative way, opportunities to develop new industries and new, in new initiatives uh, in these areas, which can see a, a stimulation of really positive economic growth. And I'm thinking particularly about what the Latrobe Valley Authority has achieved in Victoria, uh, following um, the closures of both Hazelwood and Energy Bricks. Uh, the closure of Hazelwood does get some bad press, but in truth, 12 months after Hazelwood closed, there was less unemployment um, in that area than there was at the time of its closure. So the Latrobe Valley Authority, together with Angers and the state government, and indeed with some federal government assistance as well, was able to work through the challenges in that area and deliver a positive result for the community. Another positive example uh, is in Collie in WA, where the government and synergy over there uh, has been working already uh, with closure dates coming up in later in the 2020s with their communities about reskilling and diverse opportunities through the local economy. So there is lots of uh, good work underway, Minister, and we certainly welcome um, federal government interest and engagement in a more coordinated approach. Uh, with the one rider, I think, that we don't want to see a duplication of work that is already being done, um, because we do worry about building unnecessary costs into this system, and what we want to do is leverage off the work that is already being done by the industry and by local communities and state governments. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Steve Murphy. This is a huge transition for the economy generally, and it's a very big transition for some specific communities. What do communities need to take advantage of the opportunities that are coming and manage the risks? And what does the country stand to benefit if we can get it right? Thank you, Minister. That's Thank you, Minister. That's two really important questions. I might start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today, pay my respects to elders past and present, and to acknowledge any uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here today. Secondly, if I could say thank you and acknowledge the Prime Minister and the Treasurer for pulling this together and putting in us the trust to come together and identify where we can work together on common ground to find the path through. And lastly, to acknowledge all of my trade union comrades who are here today. Uh, and all of those that are listening or paying attention online uh, and acknowledge that the voices and hopes of workers are once again accepted and being heard in this parliament. Uh, as you rightly pointed out, Minister, this is an economic and industrial tra transition 
the largest in our lifetime and probably the largest that we will experience. And we can't leave a transition of this size up to private capital. At the centre of this transition are hundreds of thousands of workers and their communities. And precious time has already been wasted on climate culture wars. Uh, climate change is real. It's impacting on our jobs, on our community and our lives. Action is required to limit global heating. We support net zero by 2050 and the goal of a minimum 43% reduction by 2030. The transition is here. It is already happening, but right now it is happening to us as workers, not with us. Uh, this is not going to be a just transition unless there's also a jobs transition. I grew up in the Hunter Valley. It's where I did my apprenticeship and my trade as a fitter in the steel industry, and I've seen what a transition of an industry can look like uh, when it's just left to its own devices. Uh, the union movement represents workers all across the supply chains that feed in and out of our energy and mining communities. Uh, workers know that there is something coming, but they feel like no one has their back and no one is planning for their future. Uh, these workers and their communities uh, are going to feel earliest and hardest the impacts of decisions that have already been made in overseas boardrooms and are happening in, in boardrooms here in Australia. And it's out those workers and those communities that have empowered not just our economy but our homes for generations. They have looked after us and now in their time of need we need to return that favour and make sure that we look after them. And what we can't have is these workers experience being that which has happened in our solar farms all across the country where we've seen exploitation, wage theft and intimidation as the new form of employment and jobs. When I've been travelling around and talking to workers in these communities, there's three common themes that always stick out, three things that they say are important to get this right. The first one is to have a table where decisions are made at, but importantly, a seat at that table for workers so that their voices can be heard. But it's to support and amplify those local voices and efforts that are already underway and to encourage them to continue that work, to proactively provide the services, the support and the security and the advice that they need to be able to press through and keep on going to coordinate a consistent approach so that we get equity of outcomes no matter where this transition has happened and of course collaboration of all levels of government if we're going to make this work. Uh, we're calling on the federal government, we call on the federal government to establish an independent and properly funded statutory national energy transition authority. Encouragement and voluntary contribution is not going to get us there. And I acknowledge that there's already been broad support for uh, that particular uh, energy transition authority to be set up in that way from across the unions and the business community. The second thing they always say when you talk to them about is that we need to make things here and again in Australia if we're going to have a future. There's been this wave of public support where there's a consciousness built up again about the fault lines in our international supply chains but the weaknesses in our own global supply chains that hit us hardest when COVID was at its worst. And we can and do make good things here in Australia. We haven't lost our capacity, but what we've lost is government support and, and political will to support our small to medium enterprises to grow and to make that happen. And there are three things that we can do and take advantage of it. The first one is to value add to our agricultural, to our resources and minerals, to our steel and aluminium industries and create hundreds of thousands of good jobs. Secondly, we can have a renewable energy powerhouse, but it's got to be supported by a strong industry policy that is proud of Australian ideas, of Australian industry capacity and of the skills of Australian workers. What, a discussion about what our renewable energy mix is going to be, a discussion about how re rewiring the nation will contain Australian steel and how we will claim our space in those global supply chains and also provide those needs of energy to our region. Lastly, of course, we can be a green manufacturing powerhouse, a superpower in the world to use our cheapest renewable energy power to power a recovery in manufacturing, a manufacturing-led recovery from COVID. We've got a national reconstruction fund with $15.2 billion where we can bolt down what we currently have, secure our local supply chains for the future, but most importantly, 
provide the support to small business and the medium-sized enterprises so that they can get a foothold in these new and emerging industries and capture on the world stage what Australia can actually achieve here right now. Whether that's wind towers all the way through to electric vehicles, whether it's our transport and logistic needs for the future, all those IP all the way through to the digital technology needs that we are going to have. And the last thing that the workers always talk about is having that sense of security about the future. What's the job? What's the pay? What's the conditions? How are we going to attract and retain workers into this new industry that we're going to, to build? Where's the job guarantee for the workers who are currently worried about their future and what's going to happen to their communities? And what is the skills plan that's going to create those opportunities for all workers? For workers in mining and energy communities, uh, for workers who are currently experiencing insecure work, who want the opportunity to get an apprenticeship, whether they're old, whether they're young, for women, for Indigenous workers, for disabled workers, but for all of us. And if we can do all of those three things, where we create a statutory authority, we've got a future made here in Australia, where our skills, our, our ideas and our labour is valued and respected, then we will deliver climate action and job creation, and that is justice for workers in this transition. Thank you, Minister. Thanks, Steve. Now, you, no one will be surprised to know that many people wish to make a contribution from the floor, and we have, say, 14 minutes to get through uh, quite a large number of people. So if each of you were able to confine your remarks to two minutes, we could just sneak in. Uh, I'm going to call first uh, BHP's Mike Henry to make a contribution. Where are you, Mike? Just over here. Great. Well, look, thank you. And I'll start as well by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that were gathered on, the Ngunnawal people, and pay respects to elders past and, and present. Of course, BHP, no matter where we operate on, around the world, is operating on the lands, on the lands or close to the lands of, uh, that were um, traditionally owned by, by Aboriginal and uh, First Nations peoples. So it's a particularly important set of relationships and partnership for us. Now, I'm here today representing 45 to 50,000 employees and, um, and workers across BHP here in Australia. I also feel like I've got a responsibility to the local commun host communities that we operate in and the thousands of companies that support um, BHP and our operations. Now, I'm really hopeful for these couple of days together. BHP is, is a firm believer in the priorities that have been set out in the agenda, and we've been putting our money and our efforts where our mouths are. In the past five or six years, BHP has hired 13,000 13, more women across BHP, and that's in a workforce that is overall static. So it's a very big number and about two-thirds of those here in Australia. We've doubled the proportion of BHP's workforce here in Australia that are permanent, full-time, high-paying jobs. That's over 10,000 more permanent jobs here in BHP over the past, uh, past decade. And we've increased Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander employees from 800 to 2100 over that same time frame. So we're making very strong uh, progress. But that's not the main point. The main point is how we've gone about that. And it's by ensuring that whenever we have a dislocation in the business or an opportunity presents itself, we, make, we take full advantage of that opportunity. An example is in developing a mine in Western Australia over the past few years. It was about a four or five billion dollar investment. Now, traditionally, what we would have done is we would have gone about that in the way that we've always gone about it. Traditional workforce drawing upon the existing uh, uh, pool of workers, but spot the problem. We would have ended up with a relatively small proportion of, of, uh, of women in that workforce. But what we said is we're not going to allow that to happen. From the get-go, we'll ensure that this workforce is gender balanced. That required us then to think about how do we go about designing equipment, how do we go about training um, more women up. Uh, that combined with this commitment around doubling the proportion of the workforce that were permanent employees saw us commit at the beginning of COVID to $300 million into 2,500 apprenticeships and traineeships over a five-year period. Um, and we established two training ac academies to be able to, to, to do so. Uh, but, and so what I'm really, I would call for here is in this great opportunity, and I like how it's being talked about as not a necessity, but an opportunity for Australia, that we ensure that we harness that opportunity for its full advantage. And that when we are pursuing this energy transition, that we ensure that we um, make it a priority to ensure that that's done in a gender balanced way, 
to ensure that we increase the proportion of, of uh, that workforce that is uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. There was a, a pretty low percentage that was spoken about earlier. We should be aiming for that to be at least aligned with the representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the population. But I would say let's go further. In BHP it's over 8%. And I would say it's not just about employment. How do we ensure that there's opportunities for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders equity participation through that journey as well? And what a wonderful opportunity that would be for economic in, uh, empowerment. So that's priority number one. Let's harness the transition to its full advantage. The second encouragement that I would give the panel and everybody else in the room is let's make sure it's grounded in reality. There's a big gulf between hope and a plan. And what we have to ensure is that there's appropriate benchmarking of um, economics here, productivity, policy settings to ensure that we're able to attract the capital to Australia that's going to allow us to develop the uh, mineral resources that we have and to develop the clean energy, energy industry here because as the point was made earlier, this is a competition and others are moving really quickly and we, are, we don't have the same natural advantages in uh, renewable energy or frankly in copper, nickel, lithium and so on that we had in commodities like iron ore and uh, coal. So we are going to have to compete hard and we should get clear up front on what's required for us to outcompete others around the world. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm going to call the member for Melbourne, Adam Bant. Thank, thank you. Um, I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners and say um, how nice it is to see clean energy and climate groups in this building without a hunted look in their eyes. And so thank you very much for um, uh, that terrific session. Uh, I'm excited about the plans for developing um, programs and skills training for clean energy workers because we're going to need them. But I wanted to talk about uh, coal and gas workers in particular and the, um, the transition. Uh, w unless we are honest with um, workers and communities in these regions that coal and gas have a use-by date and that it's coal and gas that is fueling the climate crisis, the transition is not going to be not going to be just much harder. Um, these workers and communities are going to have further to fall because at some point, and at some point potentially soon, the rest of the world is going to tell us to stop digging. And our three major um, trading par uh, partners that make up 75% of our export for thermal coal have all set net zero mid-century goals, which if you work backwards, means they're going to decarbonise their electricity system sometime in the next decade or two. And we need to be real about that. And we can't leave the future of these communities um, up to geopolitical events or the whim of the markets or decisions that are being made by overseas governments or in overseas boardrooms. So I want to propose three things that are needed. Um, one is a transition authority, as has been said, that, and I, I want to propose three principles for it. It should be both national and local. Um, there needs to be national coordination, but there also need to be local authorities that have strong representation from workers, communities and businesses as well as government, but that have some control over setting the plans for their region. Uh, it should be legislated uh, and it should be funded. Um, we talk, there, there, it has been a terrible uh, lost decade, but two of the institutions that stood through that decade and delivered a lot of um, climate action were the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. And both of those um, were put in legislation and had their funding secured. And if we had the same approach with a transition authority, it would give some comfort to those workers and communities that they wouldn't be at the whim of changing government uh, and that their future, the ability to manage their future would be secured. The second thing that I think is critical is that we have a legislated uh, and at least clear timetable for the phase out of coal and gas. Um, if it is uncertain uh, and it is lumpy, then it leaves a lot more scope for dislocation. And we've seen um, the effects of dislocation, not only the economic and social effects, but also the political effects as well. And um, I, that's something that we could see coming here in Australia and we should avoid if we can. The third thing that uh, I want to propose is that government give a job and wage guarantee for workers in these sectors. The model that we have proposed um, would see a, a, a coal worker who is taken from coal and put in a new business be guaranteed um, their wages for a period of up to 10 years, with the government providing a 50% subsidy to any new business that takes them on. 
And that would do two things. One is it would provide a lot of security for those workers and enable the transition to happen much more um, smoothly. But secondly, it would incentivise businesses to come into regions where coal and gas are getting out, knowing that they're going to get government support to establish there. Um, and lastly, um, while I've got the microphone, uh, the, um, if we're going to have the investment in childcare that there seems to be very large acceptance for, I think we should go the whole hog and make it free. Um, the cost, of, in the same way that we think about primary school, we should think about childcare in that way as well. Imagine the weight off every business in this country if they knew that every employee, um, no matter how much they earned, had access to free childcare. Thanks, Adam. Okay, now we haven't done terribly well on my injunction that people uh, speak for two minutes only, um, and I'm not call calling attention to any particular contribution. Um, but I'm going to ask the next couple of contributors to really keep it tight because we probably aren't going to get to everyone who wants to speak. Um, but it's a pleasure to invite Jeremy Rockcliffe, uh, Tasmania's Premier, to make a contribution. Thank you, Minister, and I'll do my best to keep within the two minutes. And can I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of which we meet today? And uh, can I thank very much the Prime Minister and uh, Treasurer for bringing us together here uh, today? It's been wonderfully productive and informative, and I appreciate being involved. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, as you can appreciate, uh, Tasmania has uh, a lot of passion and commitment when it comes to clean energy and climate change, and indeed. A uh, big history as well, and we'd have to say that what's important is that the move to zero transmission needs to be very ca carefully managed uh, for the workforce, for businesses, for community. Uh, we have some history, um, hydro industrialisation over the 40s, 50s and 60s, um, some conflict generated as a result of that in the late 70s and early 80s. But uh, one of the best things that the governments, both state and federal and business, can do is to, in a, to assist in workforce planning is to provide that certainty and a clear pathway to manage the energy transition, which of course is now underway. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact uh, that Tasmania introduced a nation-leading framework on climate change and a target of net zero emissions or lower uh, from 2030, and of course have a real focus on Project Marinus and the Battery of the Nation initiatives and of course supporting broader renewable energy sector as well. Uh, but we will simply uh, not be able to meet our collective and ambitious goals in reducing emissions and transitioning to a clean energy future without the requisite workforce. This is key. It's a key issue for this decade, not only for Australia's emission reduction efforts, but also in developing the workforce uh, to drive this economy-wide uh, uh, change. There are a number of uh, partnerships with the federal government we've got, including, of course, the Energising Tasmania program and the Renewable Hydrogen Industry Development Funding Program, which I won't go into at this particular point in time, but I do want to focus on a few areas, and that is uh, the commitment to vocational education and the training system, and how we can uh, ensure that we transform our vet sector to be modern, uh, flexible, uh, uh, agile to learners, communities and business needs as well who are investing in uh, the workforce. I believe uh, very clearly that the vision and principles of the new national skills agreements uh, will help and go a long way, but uh, we need, in my view, to do more uh, training for transmission, manufacturing components, of course, new industrial processes for making hydrogen, uh, green steel will be needed if Australia is truly to become a clean energy superpower. Uh, we, we appear to be on a unity ticket uh, when it comes to the establishment of a tra transition authority uh, to work with communities and uh, map career pathways, uh, Kane, but also the importance of raising uh, the profile, indeed, of clean energy as a career opportunity for all Australians and, indeed, look at funding uh, higher education, teaching and research to serve clean energy industries and, again, uh, position vocational education and training to respond uh, to industry needs. I've probably gone over my two minutes, but leadership uh, and common sense were mentioned by Kane. I'll throw in uh, collaboration and uh, Tasmania uh, as well and truly willing and able uh, to play our part. Thank you very much. Thank you, Premier. Uh, I call Robert Potter, who is the National Secretary of the Australian Services Union. Uh, thanks, Senator, and I'll keep to the two minutes. Um, I'll even pat it out by uh, joining Dylan as a uh, washed-up tennis player. Under eight, Ali Barna, uh, public doubles was my pinnacle, but uh, we'll share a beer later. Um, 
Thanks, Senator. As National Secretary of the Australian Services Union, that represents workers throughout the energy supply chain. I also grew up in Newcastle in the Hunter region, and my, many of my family worked in coal mines. Um, we urgently need a just transition. In fact, we needed one a decade ago. Since then, 12 coal-fired power stations have closed. Two-thirds of Australia's remaining coal generation capacity is set to shut in eight short years, according to AEMO, our energy market operator. On current trends, that's likely to happen even sooner. We urgently need an energy transition authority. It's planning and investment that is needed to help create new job opportunities in emerging renewable energy industries, especially in those very regions that are undergoing transition and that have powered this country for so long. But we also need to make sure that these new jobs are secure ones, ones that are fairly paid, and that they're genuinely replacing the ones that may be lost. This requires long planning horizons. It involves serious coordination and investment across all levels of government, industry and unions. And it must involve critically those local councils, their communities and workers, especially in regional Australia. In summary, Senator, national coordination, shared best practice, urgency and local solutions. A shared commitment coming out of this summit to set up just such an authority would be an excellent outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I've got a big red sign that says time's up, but I'm going to ignore it and call Andrew Barr, but I fear that you are going to have to be the last contribution, and I apologise to the other people who were seeking to, ma to, to make a contribution. We can talk about it at dinner. Andrew. Thank you very much, Jenny, and I thank the Prime Minister and the Treasurer for convening this summit. Leadership from Canberra matters. There is another government in Canberra, and I just want to share some uh, good news <laughs> stories. In 2012, we committed that this city would be powered 100 per cent by renewable electricity. We got there in 2020. It can be done. This year we've committed that 2035 will be the last year that you can buy a new internal combustion engine vehicle, and by 2045 we'll phase out of the use of natural gas. It can be done. It can be done in a just way, and the national capital wants to show that leadership. And my offer to everyone who's interested is to partner with us in the electrification of Canberra. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. That was in fact so short that we could ask for one more contribution if, if Mr Forrest was willing to keep it short. Can you keep it short, Twiggy? Well, I'm not volunteering. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Jim, thank you for pulling us all together. Thanks for taking the rap, mate, for not inviting everyone else. Um, yeah, look, I've only got three things I want to say. Up in my home in the Pilbara, you know, the weather's pretty harsh but beautiful. That's where the Indigenous mob we employed live. Uh, we have 15 per cent employment there, and I want to thank them for their 60,000 odd years before us for caring for country. But also point out that for all vulnerable Australians, and including Indigenous people, we can't employ any more Indigenous people than we would if we could. Uh, we've got to face up to the fact there are serious impediments now to employing more vulnerable Australians. It could be uh, all the group which Dylan represents or, or my mob, but also women. Women are the unsung giant which we're not utilising in our economy. And we need to get to full employment, and we're not going to do that until we remove those impediments to employing women. And I really want to say that very strongly. I see a nation with full employment, potentially for at least our generation, if not also our kids and grandkids' generation. And that is a nation which accepts that people are not married to fossil fuel. People are married to their families, their communities and their careers. And if we're serious about that, we do have a country which can be the Saudi Arabia of energy, but it's 100 per cent green. And anyone who says, hey, look, uh, that's just a dream, whatever, uh, can I tell you it's not? You know, BHP started life at 6 million tonnes of iron ore at Newman. It's now 280 million tonnes. That is 30 times more than they started with. If we took Australia up 
by 28 times our electricity production, which we can easily do. I can show you the maths, I can show you the areas, I can show you the wind speeds. We could easily do that. Then we would be producing more green electricity and energy and hydrogen than Saudi Arabia, which happily supports 34 million people. So I want to put it out there. We could do this. Do we have the courage? Do we have the tenacity? Do we have the vision? I think we have in government. Do we have it in the business sector? Can we bring those two together? Let's find out. It has my full backing. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. And I want to acknowledge that the final speaker, who we just are not going to be able to hear from because I'm very conscious we stand between you and a photo, uh, was Zali Stegel. And I know that um, Zali has wanted to contribute and has made a significant contribution to the national debate. So, Zali, we'll find some time to talk about this um, over dinner, um, and there'll be other opportunities to acknowledge you. Um, look, some big themes coming through. Um, today, and I just wanted to touch on a couple of areas where the government uh, is ready to take some steps quite quickly. Um, states and territories, along with the Commonwealth, have agreed to develop a national energy workforce strategy. And the work that is being done by industry, by industry represent representatives, uh, by unions, by communities to think about the workforce requirements will be a key input into that strategy. And I think that is a key area for collaboration between us. States and territories have also agreed through energy ministers to establish a First Nations clean energy strategy. And it offers an opportunity to remedy some of the deficiencies that many of the speakers today have identified around Indigenous employment in this sector. Secondly, the manufacturing opportunity, the opportunity to bolster supply chain resilience by enhancing domestic capacity um, is a key focus for the National Reconstruction Fund. Minister Husick was up here earlier today. He is working on standing up that fund very closely with Minister Husick. And one of the messages I think we are hearing today is that a key focus for that fund will be increasing Australia's value adding and clean energy manufacturing. And the final area, which of course has also been the subject of significant discussion this afternoon, is the arrangements for local communities and the need for place-based approaches uh, to the economic transition that is underway. I understand that yesterday uh, at National Cabot, Cabinet, the government, states and territories uh, have de uh, decided to work on a common set of principles for an orderly transition to a net zero economy. And that will be the first step towards a coordinated approach with industry, with unions, with local governments and communities to help regional communities prosper in a clean energy future. These are just some of the steps we will need to take. This is a very significant transition. The common thread that emerges through all of our discussions in the lead up to the summit and in the contributions today is that a transition of this kind will require more coordination than we are used to. We understand that as a government, it is a role we are willing to play and we are keen to work with all willing partners in putting together the architecture to make this transition come about. So thank you to our panellists, if we can give them all a very big uh, clap and a thanks. And thank you to all of you and particularly all of you, those of you who were able to make a contribution. I know there were many more who would have liked to, so thank you all as well. Uh, Jenny, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad that someone else got to share the load with <laughs> um, trying to, to get to everyone, but you did an excellent job. Um, and to Andrew Forrest, really interested in catching up with you at dinner um, to talk women. Um, great to hear your contribution at uh, this stage of the day. Um, and with that, we are a bit out of time. We're going to, you'll see that there's a a bit going on above um, and we will have a photo shortly. So if you need to adjust your tie or comb your hair, whatever it is, um, you can prepare to do that. But before we do that, I just want to hand over to the Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, to wrap up the day's proceedings. Thank you.
in the interest of time, I'll only speak for about 45 minutes, if that's OK. Um, look, my job is really to wrap today up, and so I won't speak at any great length, but really to say uh, that the progress that we've made today and the contributions that people have made today have been exactly why we brought you together. Uh, and you know, really setting the tone, whether it's the very, very thoughtful presentations uh, from Danielle and Leonora and Claire, which provided some really considered kind of scaffolding to the conversation that we had today, uh, all the way through to the panellists, uh, the contributions from the floor, uh, the way that people have been interacting with each other and not just with the lectern and seeing where we can find common ground has been uh, really incredibly encouraging. Uh, can I say in particular, uh, when it comes to the work that's being done uh, by the employer groups uh, and the union movement in particular. Uh, I think there has been a demonstration today that people are prepared to give a little in order to get a lot in return, and that, again, has been really encouraging and really heartening. Uh, can I say about the premiers uh, of both political persuasions from right around Australia, it means a lot to us uh, that you have been there being part of this conversation for the whole day. Uh, and I really wanted to acknowledge that with all the demands on your time, the fact that we cannot solve these challenges that have been rightly identified today without working together, not just with each other, not just business and unions and community groups, but all levels of government as well. I wanted to uh, really acknowledge uh, the commitment that the premiers uh, have shown as well to this process. And to the ministers who've led sessions, I want to thank you for keeping your minds open, uh, the doors of consultation open, uh, and the checkbook closed. Um, uh, but thank you to the ministers who've led conversations, to Helen, uh, to all of the uh, workers, all of the staff uh, who've got us here today. I don't really want to go much beyond that except to say that the progress that we've made today gives me great heart and great encouragement. Uh, for tomorrow as well. I'm confident that we will have uh, another opportunity tomorrow to make uh, progress uh, tomorrow in some other really crucial policy areas as well. And I'm looking forward to speaking to you from this lectern tomorrow afternoon, hopefully, uh, and I'm cautiously optimistic about this, uh, with a handful of quite concrete measures that we can progress this year and then obviously a list of work that will continue into the white paper, into subsequent budgets, into uh, conversations at the Federation uh, and all of the other ways that we can work together. But most of all, thank you very much. All right. And this is going to be the hardest thing I, I do all day. Um, there is an photo, official photograph is it about to take place before um, the delegates move through to dinner. We'll be moving through like we did uh, for lunch um, behind me, but before we do that, can I ask the uh, is observers, I'm sorry to do this to you, um, to please depart through the door, just that big one. Um, it's been great having you in the room. Really? I mean that? <laughs> I just said to the task force, if I can pull this off, It'll be bigger than the communique tomorrow afternoon. Um, so once they've uh, happily left the room, I, um, will, I'm going to ask, this is how it's going to work. The people that are standing directly, um, standing, seated directly in front of me, you are all to stand and turn around and stay right where you are. So that's the group, there's three rows of you, uh, Linda, Whoever I have my eyesight is terrible at this hour of the day. It's tight. Um, Anthony, Pratt, if you all stand and face that way, you can see the photographers in front of you. Fantastic. This is fun. <laughs> I'm starting to enjoy this. Um, uh, to everyone on either side, not the, the ministers or the premiers, you can just twiddle your thumbs for a little bit longer. Enjoy sitting down. To everyone on the other side, on the either side of them, please stand and walk down the side and in front where the observer chairs are. I hope there's not too much of a bottleneck down there. 
This is for prosperity. You'll be able to talk about this from years to come. I'm reliably told there's a wide angle lens. How are we doing up there? Is that looking great? No, you want them to squish together. I can see that. So please show even more collaboration and spirit of unity and move in. If you are struggling to find a spot, find a friend in the back row and jump in next to them. <laughs> Kate, I think you're too small to be back there. <laughs> do you want to, Kate, do you want to just swap out? <laughs> you don't know, all right. Okay, so now we've done that. You're all gonna have to squish back because I have two more rows to join you. The sides need to move into the middle.